a sleepy little western town, an invasion of epidemic proportions. Science fiction is now fact. The Invasion Walter Colby was a rancher and farmer, not an expert on giant arachnids whose behavior patterns confounded Diane Ashley, a recognized scientist. How, then, could Colby even begin to suspect anything about the altered nesting habits of these creatures that had invaded his property and ravaged his livestock? How could he know that even as he stood there, battalions of spiders were scurrying to safety down tunnels, making their way through a maze-like network of passageways beneath the sandy Arizona soil? At that very moment, before the flames had completely died down, Trapdoors were springing open just beyond Colby's line of sight, and spiders were crawling out, thousands upon thousands of them, their venomous jaws working back and forth, their appetites growing by the hour. Kingdom of the Spiders Novelization by Bernhardt J. Herwood Based upon the original screen story by Jeffrey M. Sneller and Stephen Lodge Narrated by John Olson. Chapter 1 It was a typical Monday morning in Camp Verde. Aside from the usual small-town concessions to the 20th century, the view from the main street was not very different from the time when the gas station at the edge of town had been a blacksmith's shop. The sky was a deep, rich blue, except for a slight morning haze burning away from the peaks of the Mazatzal Mountains to the south. A forty-foot trailer truck rumbled through town at seventy-five miles an hour, the driver grinning to himself, knowing perfectly well that Sheriff Gene Smith couldn't care less about such minor technical infractions before nine in the morning. Turning his battered jeepster off the road into his gas station, Big Earl Forbes reached into the pocket of his shirt, pulled out a plug of tobacco, and prepared for another lazy spring day. As he went about the perfunctory duties of opening up the station, it occurred to him that his reserve tanks were running pretty low, and with the fare coming up soon, he had to make sure they were topped off well in advance. He looked at his watch. It was too early to call the distributor and flagstaff. Best thing to do now was put on a pot of coffee. Out at the Colby Ranch, about five miles west of town, there was more than the usual activity for this time of the week although to the casual observer there would appear to be nothing out of the ordinary. It was just a typical, small, southwestern spread. Just beyond the low, whitewashed five-room house was a medium-sized barn housing several cows, some horses, and a sizable hayloft. A dozen or so chickens of assorted sizes ambled contentedly around the buildings, and they passed beneath parked pieces of farm machinery. A large yellow mongrel dog watched them out of the corner of his eye. Alongside the ranch house, Walter Colby was cutting wood with a battered saber saw. He was a large man in his early fifties. The lines in his face resembled the furrows in the fields he plowed. His overalls and work shirt were faded from many washings, and his hands were calloused from years of hard physical work. He had come to Camp Verde forty years earlier, penniless, an orphan, unwanted, and regarded with suspicion by the local townsfolk. But by virtue of hard work and a personal dedication to wresting a living from the dry desert soil, not only had he saved enough to purchase this plot of land, he had earned the respect of his neighbors. All in all, there was nothing exceptional about Colby, nothing to distinguish him from the dozens of other small ranchers like him, other than the fact that he was black. At the moment, despite the slight chill of the early morning air, there were beads of sweat forming on his brow. His face wore a look of great contentment, and he was singing somewhat off-key at the top of his voice. The door of the storage shed next to the house swung open, and Colby's wife, Birch, came out carrying a large wicker wash-basket full of empty mason jars and lids. She was about ten years her husband's junior, but she looked even younger. Birch didn't pamper herself, and matched Walt's workday hour for hour, yet in spite of this she was an attractive woman. She paused for a moment and contemplated him. "'Hey, you're feeling mighty cheerful this morning. Ain't heard you sing like that since last Christmas.' Walter switched off the saw, put it carefully down on the ground, and wiped his forehead with his sleeve. "'Yeah,' he said, grinning. 
These things are looking good. Bertha is bound to win first prize at the fair. I can feel it in my bones. Birch returned his smile and tossed her head. Then you can count on two blue ribbons, old man, because my preserves this year are the best I ever put up. And with an affirmative nod of the head, she moved towards the back door of the house. Walter shook his head slightly, the grin still on his face, and called after her, Your preserves are not going to buy us a new pickup, woman, but that calf sure will. Sure as I'm cutting this wood. With that, he bent down, retrieved the saber saw, switched on the power, and went back to work, singing along at the top of his voice. Briefly, he gazed off in the direction of the pasture beyond the barn, where Bertha, the white-faced, blue-ribbon hopeful, was lazily munching on a clump of fresh, green grass. What Walter Colby could not possibly have seen was the motionless shape of an immense, hairy spider approximately the size of a man's fist. As the calf moved, the creature scurried after it, maintaining a distance of about three feet between them. All the time it followed the calf's every move with its tiny, gleaming, beady eyes, eyes that on closer examination would have resembled no visual organs ever seen in the head of an arachnid before. Suddenly the spider flew through the air as if catapulted by a powerful spring mechanism. Landing squarely on the calf's hind quarters, it buried its fangs perhaps three-quarters of an inch into the animal's rump. Simultaneously, at another place several miles beyond the other end of the Camp Verde, a man and a woman on horseback were advancing on a fleeing steer. The man, Rack Hansen, a rugged, fair-haired individual in his mid-thirties, thundered past Terry, his sister-in-law, and readied his lariat. His face was set in an expression of business-like concentration, and with his free hand he motioned for the woman to flank the steer as he closed in on its right side. She responded at once, making it impossible for the fleeing animal to veer off, and within seconds its head was encircled by the lariat. Now, as the rope became taut as a steel cable, the man forced his quarry to do a backward flip, turning the beast a hundred and eighty degrees in the opposite direction. It snorted in protest, but to no avail. Pulling his mount to a sudden stop, Rack dismounted as casually as he might descend a staircase, and keeping the lariat taut, advanced towards the confused calf. With a quick, deliberate move, he made a grab for the animal's feet. Then, lunging backwards, he sent it crashing to its side with a heavy thud. Before the cloud of dust had cleared, he pulled a piece of rope from between his teeth and with the confident movements of an expert, he securely tied three of the steer's legs. Smiling and throwing both hands in the air above his head, Rack turned confidently to face Terry as she rode towards him. As the horse stopped, she dismounted, took a leather case from her saddlebag, and handed it to Rack. That was adequate, she said with an air of mock disinterest. What the hell do you mean, adequate? he demanded, opening the leather case and taking out a large hypodermic syringe and ampule. It was damn good, and you know it. He muttered the affirmation half to himself as he carefully filled the syringe. Then, checking it carefully, he bent over the steer, which by now was bellowing mightily. Plunging the needle deftly into the animal's hindquarters, Rack completed the injection and handed the syringe back to Terry. Without missing a beat, he reached into the leather case for a tagging tool. Then, holding the steer's head down with his free hand, he attached the tag expertly to its ear. Next, with almost an automatic action, he gently checked the calf's mouth and eyes. "'What do you say, cow?' he asked playfully. The creature let out another bellow, as if in response. Rack turned to Terry, grinned, and said, "'Cow says I did a right tidy job.' The tagging finished, Rack leaned down, pulled the rope from around the steer's neck, and then stood back and did the same with the one around its feet. For a moment it remained motionless on the ground, but then suddenly realized that it was no longer bound and rolled to its feet. It glared defiantly at the two humans, and with a final bellow, followed by a snort and a flick of the tail, turned and ran off. Terry, taking the steer's antics in with obvious amusement, began to snicker. Now Rack, his eyes twinkling mischievously, broke into a broad, almost lecherous grin. Picking up the lariat, he began swinging it and advancing on her. Rack! You wouldn't dare! 
she began, recognizing at once what he had in mind. Rack, cut it out. Get back. Come here, little doggie, he called, grinning now from ear to ear and stalking her with solid determination. Terry turned to run, and Rack let out an ear-splitting rebel yell. Then, with an incredible leap, half-broad jump, half-flying tackle, he caught her by the ankles. Squealing at the top of her lungs, she went down in a heap, dragging Rack along, and the two of them rolled, tumbling down a small hill, arms and legs flailing and thrashing about in a cloud of dust. By the time they reached the bottom of the hill and the dust had settled, Terry resembled a human pretzel. Both legs were tied to her left wrist, and Rack jumped back, raising both hands in the air over his head as he had after roping the steer. "'Damn you, John!' screamed Terry hoarsely, suddenly cutting herself off as if she had uttered a forbidden word. Rack's grin vanished. His face hardened as he reached down, expertly whipping the rope from Terry's ankles and wrists. The game was over. He turned on his heel and stalked off so that Terry could not see the look on his face. For an instant she looked as if she were going to cry, but her expression changed to one of hurt and confusion. She picked herself up and began running after Rack, who by now had reached the waiting horses. All business now, he closed the leather case that held the hypodermic and replaced it in his saddlebag. Rack, Terry began hesitantly, I'm a lot of things to a lot of people, he interrupted, but I'm not my brother. He paused for emphasis and looked her in the eye. He's not around any more, Terry. He's dead, and it's time you got used to the idea. Tears began gathering in Terry's eyes, and she looked as though she was about to say something when a sharp beeping sound began emitting its strident tones from inside Rack's saddlebag. Reaching in and shutting it off, he mounted his horse. "'Must be an emergency,' he said. "'I'd better get a move on. See you later.' And without another word, he rode off. She watched him as the distance grew between them. He was right, of course. She knew it. Rack was doing all he could to give Terry and her young daughter Linda moral and any other kind of support he possibly could without interfering with his own work as a veterinarian. Besides... He had his own life to lead, and his own future. It was just that the resemblance between him and his dead brother was so great that sometimes she had difficulty avoiding the trap of fantasizing that Rack was John. She sighed, mounted her horse, and headed back to the house. She had her own work to do, and time wouldn't stand still on her account. Chapter 2 Except for the sign... U.S. Department of Agriculture, Veterinary Service. The complex of buildings that Rack called headquarters resembled any number of farms and small ranches in the area. Nestled in the midst of a wide vista of red desert, it was flanked on one side by the beginnings of foothills where trees were struggling for survival, and on the other by patchy clumps of desert vegetation. During the day when the sun's hot rays beat down unmercifully, it seemed to be the only tangible thing in an unreal world. All around in the distance, as far as the eye could see, were heat waves rising from the desert floor. It gave the impression that everything was nothing more than a shimmering mirage. Rack looked at his wristwatch as he reined his horse to a stop just outside the barn. It was only a little after eleven o'clock, and getting hotter by the moment. Buenos dias, Doc called a young Mexican, who approached as Rack dismounted. "'Good morning, Louis,' Rack answered, removing his saddlebags. "'Give him a good rundown. He's had quite a workout already today.' "'Sure thing, Doc.' The young man took the reins and led the horse toward the stable. Rack, slinging the saddlebags over his shoulders, entered the barn and headed for a green wooden box attached to the wall. Opening the door of the box, he reached in and took out a telephone— he dialed, then said, "'Hi, this is Rack. What have you got?' He paused, listening, then replied, "'Okay, I'll head out there right away.' "'Yeah, it must be important. If he calls again, just tell him I'm on my way.' He hung up the phone, took the leather case from the saddlebag, and headed toward a dusty Ford Bronco parked to the side of the barn's entrance." He was just about to climb into the driver's seat when he heard the impatient honking of a truck horn outside, 
and he became abruptly aware of the sound of tires on gravel. There was an urgency to it all, and he walked over to the barn door. A mud-caked pickup truck was grinding to a stop in a cloud of dust. Walter Colby climbed out and headed toward Rack, an expression of anxiety on his face. Rack smiled and held out his hand. I didn't expect to see you here, Walter. Colby seized Rack's hand and shook it firmly. Couldn't wait, Doc. They told me you'd called twice already, and I was just about to head out your way. Colby turned toward the truck, and Rack followed. I thought maybe it'd be best if I came out here, Doc, Colby explained. You know that calf I've been spouting off about? She's real sick, and I'm damned if I know what it could be. It come on so fast. Sorry to hear that, Walt, but you've had sick cows before. I don't think I've ever seen you this worked up about it. Instead of answering directly, Colby undid the latch on the tailgate and slammed it down. Ain't seen nothing like this before, he declared. What do you make of it? The calf lay on its side, breathing hoarsely and with great difficulty. Each time it exhaled, a clear liquid flowed from its nose. It was frothing at the mouth, and one eye was so badly swollen shut it was practically hidden. Most peculiar of all was the fact that covering a large part of its head, like some bizarre hat at a crazy angle, was a flimsy silken mesh that looked as though the beast had walked head first into a thick mass of cobwebs. Looks to me like she walked into a hornet's nest, Colby muttered. It just don't make sense. Instead of answering, Rack bent down and carefully examined the calf's eyes and mouth. It twitched several times, the convulsions growing more violent each time. Colby was so concerned about seeing his calf survive, he did not seem to read the grim expression on Rack Hansen's face, nor did he seem to be aware that the animal's vital signs were fading rapidly. His nerves were obviously beginning to get the better of him. The words came rapidly now. The pitch of his voice rose, betraying his anxiety. "'What do you think, Doc?' he asked hoarsely. "'I got a lot of money riding on that calf. Got her entered in the county fair. Bound to win, too.' Rack cut him off abruptly. "'Pull the truck around to the lab. It ain't Blackleg, is it, Doc?' "'I'll let you know in a few hours, Walt. It's the best I can do.' "'Guess I'll just hang around, then, if you don't mind.' Rack put a reassuring hand on the black man's shoulders. "'Sure thing, Walt. I'll see you at the lab in a couple of minutes. I've got to pick up a few things from the supply shed.' After helping Rack and two assistants move the calf from the pickup truck to a large examining table in the lab, Colby hastened to leave. He didn't like the strong chemical smell that permeated the air. Besides, he preferred the hot sun outside to the air-conditioned coolness inside. Rack arrived moments later. Donning a white lab coat, he went directly to the table where the calf lay. Although the liquid still dripped slowly from its nose, it no longer breathed. It made no sense. In all his experience, he had never seen anything like this. Furthermore, there was nothing that he could recall having read in any textbook to match the calf's sudden, mysterious death. There was only one way to find out, and he knew he wasn't going to get any answers just standing there, staring. There were blood and tissue samples to be taken, not to mention the serum-like fluid that had been discharged from the calf's nose. Obtaining the necessary specimens was fairly routine work, and took Rack little more than an hour. He had just finished sealing and labeling the containers when he noticed something on the calf's pelt that he had apparently missed before. Maybe it was the way the light struck it now. In any case, he went back to take a closer look. Reaching down, he ran his hand across the area where he had seen what appeared to be a transparent, glue-like substance. It was sticky, and he held his fingers up before his eyes to obtain a closer look. Then he sniffed at it. Still no answer as to what it was. It was clearly something that required a more sophisticated laboratory analysis. Scraping as much of the substance as he could onto a microscope slide, he placed the glass in a slide box and placed it into the case containing the other samples that were going to the lab for analysis. Then, striding over to his desk, he picked up the phone and flashed the operator. <laughs> Hello, Mildred, he said. Get on the horn to the animal pathology lab over at the university. Tell them I'm on my way over. Thanks, honey. He hung up the phone, and he removed his lab coat. 
Then he threw the coat over a chair and retrieved his hat from the coat rack. Picking up his case of samples, he went outside where Walter Colby was waiting alongside his truck. "'Calf's dead, Walt,' he said in a low voice. "'Ain't that a crock!' exclaimed Colby bitterly. Two years of breeding, shot all to hell. Rack looked Colby in the eye. I did what I could, Walt. She was just too far gone, and there's only so much I can do. You still got your bull, though. You can breed him again. An expression of pain mingled with concern came over Colby's face. Was it Blackleg? he asked. Rack shook his head. I'm not sure, Walt. I don't think so, but to make sure, I'm going to run some samples into Tempe. I want you to check your stock for me in the meantime. When I get back, we'll go out to where you found the calf. Maybe by then I ought to be able to give you some answers. There were more immediate questions in Colby's mind. You ain't gonna quarantine me, are you, Rack? Rack looked into Colby's eyes. He could recognize the fear lurking there. Quarantine to any small rancher spelled disaster, and both men knew it. I can't answer that now, Walt. All I can tell you is that I hope not. We've just got to wait and see. Holding out his hand, Rack tried to force a grin. Colby reached out and the men shook. Neither one said anything else. Walter Colby could not find it in his heart to smile back. He released Rack's hand, turned, and climbed into his truck. The grinding of the starter broke the silence until the engine coughed into action and in seconds the truck was heading toward the main road in a cloud of dust. A trifle too fast, Rack thought. He just stood there watching as it shrank in size and seemed to melt into the shimmering heat waves rising from the desert floor. Then, sighing and kicking a small rock out of his way, Rack turned toward the barn. He had nearly a hundred mile drive ahead and he didn't want to waste any time. When Walter Colby got back to his ranch, Birch, his wife, could tell the minute he stepped down from the truck that their worst fears had been realized. She tried her best all afternoon to make small talk, to pull him out of his slump, but nothing seemed to work. Like a man in a trance, he drifted in and out of the house, doing an odd job here, another there, but nothing that took long or required any deep concentration. Birch knew that when Walt got like this, there was little more she could do than go about her business and wait till he snapped out of it. At times like this, she always prepared an extra special dinner. Somehow, after he had settled down with a full belly, Colby began to see things straight again. After dinner that evening, it seemed as though he might be starting to come out of it. He sat at the kitchen table, staring off into space, his dog Jake stretched out languidly at his feet. Unexpectedly, he picked up his coffee cup and held it out to Birch. She smiled, went over to the stove, and gave him a refill. She knew that when he was ready to start talking, he would. Besides, she had plenty of work to do. There were a lot of preserves she still had to put up if she was going to enter them in the county fair. Then, on an impulse, she went over to her husband, stood behind his chair, and began gently massaging his neck. "'It's going to be all right, sweetheart.' she said softly. Rack don't want to quarantine you. If he did, we sure would have heard about it by now. Suddenly, Jake rose to his feet. The hackles on his back stood up, and he made a beeline for the door. He stood there, emitting a low, whimpering growl, trembling from head to tail. Sliding up out of his chair, Colby went over to the door, and standing just behind the dog, peered out through the glass panes into the darkness. Edit that pause out. The dog continued to growl, the hairs on the back of his neck bristling like a clothes brush. "'Well, damn it, dog,' Walter muttered. "'Don't just stand there. In or out. Make up your mind.' The dog's head had now dropped below his shoulder blades, and his growl took on a note of cold ferocity. His ears pricked up, and he was quivering with excitement. Like a predator getting ready to stalk its prey, he eased himself through his ground-level access door and out onto the porch. Suddenly, without any warning, Colby dashed to the table, raked his hand across the surface in a move of sweeping frustration, and sent all of Birch's mason jars crashing to the floor. "'Damn!' he shouted. "'It ain't fair! A thousand bucks prize money shot to hell! A man busts his ass like I've been doing all these years!' I'll tell you what it is, woman. I'll tell you what it is. 
Struggling to fight back the tears, Birch knelt to the floor and began picking up the pieces, trying as best she could to salvage something from the mess of preserves and splintered glass. "'Think I don't know,' she replied plaintively, suppressing a sob. "'Think I don't know?' Outside, the chorus of chirping crickets seemed to play an accompaniment to the twinkling of the stars as they always did on cool, crisp desert nights such as these. Only the growling and sniffing of the dog marred the harmony as he crouched and moved across the porch. Suddenly, the chirping stopped. The silence was unnatural, and old Jake's ominous growling heightened the strangeness of it. Now his mouth assumed an ugly look. Baring his fangs, he turned his head toward the barn. Then, lurching into an aggressive lope, he broke into a run and headed straight for the barn door. Chapter 3 Although it was still fairly early in the morning, Big Earl Forbes was hard at work. A cantankerous old rancher from the next county had pulled into the gas station driving an antique Buick that had been cut up and amateurishly converted into a pickup truck. It creaked, rattled, and coughed. At first glance, Earl was convinced that the whole thing would go flying apart at the seams any minute, and the fact that the rear right tire had been chewed to shreds didn't help matters. It was obvious that the driver had gone quite a distance on the flat. Earl had barely managed to peel the tire off the wheel. Standing up and shaking his head, he said, Yep, I'd say that tire's definitely had it, mister. Way I see it, you're going to need a new tire. The old man cocked his head and squinted at Earl without saying anything. Earl arched his back to stretch his muscles, then rubbed his jaw thoughtfully. I could let you have a recap for twenty-two dollars mounted, he said. The owner of the car screwed up his face even more. Got five dollars, he volunteered in a raspy voice. It's all I got. Besides, it's all the tire's worth. Earl was about to answer when the roar of an airplane engine made him look up. It was an old Steerman biplane that served as local crop duster. The pilot dipped his wings and waved as he zoomed by no more than fifty feet above the gas station. Then, turning back to his customer, who he now recognized as an eccentric old-timer who only made an appearance about once a year, Earl sighed and said, "'Okay, mister, you can give me five bucks and owe me the rest.' The old man folded his arms and stuck out his jaw. Got five dollars, he insisted. It's all I got, and I don't buy on credit. I can't sell you a tire for five dollars, snapped Earl, making no attempt to hide his annoyance. Eighteen dollars, and that's the best I can do. The old man glared at Earl for a moment, then down at the mutilated tire, and without another word, climbed into the driver's seat and started the engine. Then, throwing the car into gear with an agonizing grinding sound, he pulled toward the highway with the old tire flopping noisily against the fender. Shaking his head in disgust, Earl put one hand up to his mouth and shouted, Hold up a minute, God damn it! The old man slammed on his brakes. Earl walked halfway to where the car had stopped and said, I may have an old tire out in the shed that'll get you by till you can get something better. The man started to say something, but Earl cut him off before he could say anything. Yeah, I know. You got five dollars. That's all you got. Just pull up back here and I'll see what I can do. As he headed back to the shed, Earl spotted Rack Hansen drive up to the pump in his Bronco. Rack smiled and waved in greeting. He was about to say something when both of them were distracted by the return of the crop duster. Roaring and whistling like a dive bomber, the old biplane made a swooping pass at a field two hundred yards beyond the gas station. In spite of themselves... They stared in fascination as the pilot released a cloud of yellowish dust, then began heading straight for two large buildings, banking sharply at the last minute, easing between them before going into his climb. Baron sure can fly that machine, observed Earl. Rack glanced at the old man and the Buick. Did you just make a big sale? he asked with a grin. Earl smiled back. Yeah, I'm getting so good at this I may be able to retire pretty soon. That crazy old coot was going to drive that car out of here like that. Can I help you with anything, Rack? Rack shook his head. No, you go on and do what you're doing, Earl. I'm fine. I'll just fill her up myself. 
Then, driving into position, he switched off the ignition and went over to the pump as Earl made his way to the shed out back. Kicking the door open, Earl peered in and squinted, pausing for a moment to allow himself to get accustomed to the dark in there. Brushing aside some spider webs, he stepped in and surveyed the piles of junk that lay strewn about. Noticing the excessive number of spider webs, Earl frowned slightly and muttered, Damn spiders must be having a convention in here. Then, breaking up as many of the webs as he could reach with a tire iron, he began rummaging around until he found an old tire. He bounced it on the floor a few times and examined the tread. Reaching inside the tire, he said softly, Should have asked ten dollars for this one. Old fool out there. Jesus Christ! Dropping the tire and jumping back, Earl shook his hand up and down a few times and looked down at the floor where a huge, tarantula-sized spider had fallen. He wasn't bitten badly, but badly startled. The spider flipped itself over on its feet just in time to get drenched with a thick stream of tobacco juice. Take that, you ugly varmint! Oh, varmint. <laughs> okay, sure. Take that, you ugly varmint! snapped Earl, wiping his mouth smugly. Then, grabbing the tire, he turned for the door. Had he been equipped with rear-view vision, Earl might well have been tempted to break into a run. The spider, its beady little eyes smoldering with fury, leaped in the air, then began scurrying after him, bent on attack. When it was only inches behind him, it sprang again, and had the door to the shed not slammed shut at that precise moment, it would have landed squarely on his ankle. As he headed out toward the Buick with the mangled tire, Earl noticed a spotless little red MG pull off the road and whip around to the gas pumps just on the other side of Rack's Bronco. Its hood was open, and the veterinarian was bent over the engine checking the oil. The driver of the MG, an attractive blonde in tight white jeans and a low-cut cotton blouse, leaned over towards Rack and called out, "'Will you fill it up, please?' Maintaining a perfect poker face, Rack emerged from beneath the hood of his Bronco, glanced over at the woman, wiped his hands on a rag, and sauntered over to her side of the car. She opened the door and climbed out under Rack's approving eyes and said crisply, And when you check under the hood, will you be careful not to get grease on the paint, please? Suppressing a grin and adopting the best yokel manner he could, Rack said, No, ma'am, wouldn't want to do that. Boy, I'll bet this car goes real fast, doesn't it? Ignoring him completely, she glanced at herself in the mirror before straightening her hair slightly, and asked, "'Is there a hotel here in town?' "'Sure thing,' replied Rack. "'Just keep going straight there for a couple of miles. You'll see a sign that says, Washburn's Lodge. Emma'll put you up. Nice clean place she's got there.' "'Thank you,' she answered coolly, then asking with a note of hesitation, "'Do you have a ladies' room here?' With a perfect deadpan face, Rack said, Ladies' room's out of order. You'll have to use the men's. He paused, let his eyes play deliberately over her shapely figure, and added, I know my way around there pretty good. I could show you the way. Stand guard for you, too. I'll manage just fine, thank you, she snapped, a touch of mild annoyance in her voice. She turned and headed off towards the restrooms, with Rack watching appreciatively. Now he allowed himself the luxury of a grin and a chuckle, at which point Earl appeared from the other side of the station and headed over to Rack. Reaching into his pocket, Rack took out his wallet and gave Earl some cash for the gas and oil he had just purchased. "'Thanks, Doc,' Earl said, reaching into his pocket for change. "'I hear Colby's having some trouble. That so?' He looked up at Rack expectantly, squinting in the bright sunlight. "'Nothing serious,' replied Rack evasively. Then, nodding toward the red MG, he said, "'Owner wants that one filled up and doesn't want you to get any grease on the paint either.' "'Oh, is that so?' shot back Earl somewhat defiantly. "'Where is he at, anyway?' "'She's in the men's room,' answered Rack, climbing back into his truck and starting the engine. "'What the hell's she doing in there?' Earl shouted as Rack pulled away and headed for the highway. "'Why don't you go in and ask her?' Rack shouted back as he paused to let a fast-moving car go by. Several miles down the road was Washburn's Lodge. It consisted of a rustic main building serving as office, restaurant, and hotel, with four smaller cabins tucked away at intervals behind it, all nestled in a clump of fine old trees. On the far side of the driveway, facing the office, was a massive old oak. 
On top of a ladder leaned against the oak was a handsome, sunburned woman in her forties, wearing faded jeans, a plaid sports shirt with the sleeves rolled up to the elbows, and sneakers. She was in the process of sawing off a massive branch that had been damaged by an earlier storm. The roar of an approaching sports car distracted her, and she turned in time to see it turn off the road and glide up the dirt driveway to the front of the lodge's office. If was the red M.G. Excuse me, said the driver, looking up at Emma Washburn atop her ladder. I wonder if you can tell me where I can find the office. Emma's eyes scanned the branch she had been sawing and moved down to fix themselves on the woman. Listen, honey, declared Emma. I just sawed halfway through a branch that has to weigh 400 pounds. When it falls, guess where it's going to land? Oh, gasped the blonde, throwing the car into gear and moving out of the way. Then, watching as Emma descended the ladder, she waited for the older woman to reach the ground. They told me in town that I could rent a room here for a couple of days. Wiping the sawdust from her hand, Emma offered it to the young woman and said, That's right. Name's Emma Washburn. You gotta excuse my manners. I'm Diane Ashley, replied the woman, clasping Emma's hand. Emma smiled. Glad to meet you. Well, rooms here are nine bucks a night, cabins are eleven, and in a couple of weeks the prices go up. County fair, you know. She hesitated and looked mildly apologetic. Not that we're trying to jip you or anything like that, but Camp Verde is so far off the beaten track that we've got to make a buck any way we can. Now, we serve meals at designated hours, no later, no sooner, and the bar's open till midnight. I think I'd like a cabin, said Diane without hesitation. Emma put her hand to her mouth and called out to a gaunt-looking gray-haired man in bib overalls who was tacking a poster advertising the county fair on the wall of the lodge. Fred, give the lady a hand, will you? Without speaking, he put down his hammer, came over to the car, and reached into the MG to take Diane's suitcase. Turning to Emma, Diane said, By the way, would you know where I might be able to find Dr. Robert Hansen? He's with the... You mean Rack? interrupted Emma, grinning. It's about a twenty-minute drive south of here. The grin widened to a knowing smile. Rack a friend of yours? Oh, no, replied Diane emphatically. Well, it he ain't now. He will be soon, Emma declared. Chapter 4 Sheriff Gene Smith a large, red-faced man who might have been handsome were it not for the obvious signs of overindulgence, sat lounging on the porch at dusk outside of Rack Hansen's office, sipping contentedly on a can of beer. Inside, just beyond the screen door, Rack was listening impatiently on the telephone. He sat on the edge of a desk, his feet dangling, and with his free hand he rapped on the surface. From the expression on his face, it was obvious that he was having a difficult time getting a word in edgewise. Walter, he finally exclaimed, will you settle down? I called the university three times today. Right. They're sending someone out to examine the carcass. No, they didn't tell me why, and they didn't say when. I suppose it will be any time now. God damn it, man. No one's mentioned the word quarantine yet except you. Now calm down, and I'll get back to you as soon as I know something. All right. You take care, too. I'll talk to you. He hung up the phone, went over to a small refrigerator behind the desk, and took out two cans of beer. Then, heading for the screen door, he came out on the porch and tossed one can to the sheriff, glancing casually off in the distance up across the road at an approaching car. "'You gonna have to shut Colby down, Rack?' asked the big man. "'He'll sure be mad as hell if you do.' He leaned forward and paused for a moment to look at the car that was now nearly upon them. "'Looks like the mayor's car,' he observed. "'That can mean nothing but trouble, if you ask me.' Then, taking another swig of his can of beer, he sat back to wait for further developments. The car pulled to a screeching halt. The door opened, and the mayor, a portly man in a black suit and large white ten-gallon hat, emerged. He slammed the door shut behind him and came storming up the steps to the porch, Without any of the preliminary small talk that usually preceded any of his conversations, Mayor Connors got directly to the point. "'Now look here, Rack,' he demanded indignantly. "'What's this about you planning to quarantine the Colby Ranch? Damn it, man! 
With the county fair only three weeks away, that's mighty serious business. So's spreading a disease, retorted Rack evenly. Editorial, disease is spelled D-E-S-E-A-S-E. Uh, and editorial. The mayor took a deep breath. He was trying to think fast. He assumed the tone and manner that a defense attorney might in the face of a hostile jury. I see what you mean, Rack, of course, he began, then clearing his throat said, It's just that, well, in a small town like this one, word spreads very fast, and you know how folks are. He paused again, took out a rumpled handkerchief, and wiped his forehead, then went on. I don't have to tell you, they can get all upset over the slightest little thing. And you know as well as I do, there's a lot of money at stake here. Rack cut him off, making no effort to mask his annoyance. Well, what is it you're trying to say, Mayor? Spit it out. Let's have it. The man forced a smile, came over to Rack, and put an arm around his shoulders. Lowering his voice as if he were about to reveal some great secret, he tried to lead Rack away from a Sheriff Smith, although there was no possible way to keep him from hearing every word. Look, Rack, he said hesitantly, it's just that... Well, let me put it this way. If you find any problems, I mean the sort of thing that might shake people up out of the Colby place, keep it to yourself, will you, Rack? Sort of keep a low profile. You know what I mean? The crunch of tires accompanied by the sound of a sports car engine approaching made both men stop and turn around. It was Diane Ashley in her red MG, and Rack recognized it immediately, wondering at the same time what she was coming to his place for. Uh-oh, he muttered. Friend of yours? asked the sheriff. Not on your life, answered Rack, turning to go back into the house. Diane switched off the engine, pulled on the emergency brake, and climbed out of the car. She still wore the tight white jeans, but over the blouse she now had on a closely fitting tan suede jacket. She carried a leather attaché case as she made her way to the steps and up to the porch. Diane walked right up to the sheriff, who was comfortably sprawled out in his chair, drinking his beer. "'Good evening,' she said in a crisp, business-like voice. "'My name is Diane Ashley. I was told I could find a veterinarian by the name of Dr. Hansen here.' The sheriff rose to his feet and said, "'Pleased to meet you, ma'am. I'm Gene Smith. This is Mayor Connors.' The mayor assumed his best campaign smile and nodded a greeting. As for the doc, continued the sheriff, he's standing right over there. Rack hadn't quite made it into the house, and as Diane turned to face him, he broke into a sheepish grin. She recognized him at once, and with a mixture of surprise and annoyance, she exclaimed, You! Who, me? replied Rack, looking at the sheriff for help. Don't look at me, partner said Smith, suppressing a grin. He pulled his hat down over his eyes, slumped back in his chair, and made every conscious effort to blend into the background. Obviously a bit uneasy at this interplay and somewhat annoyed at the discovery of Rack's true identity, Diane went out of her way to assume the role of a visiting dignitary. She realized that these men were not used to dealing with a woman authority, and that she would have to state her position clearly from the start. Still, she felt a little unsure of herself. I'm from the Department of Etymology at Arizona State University in Tempe, she announced. Rack shrugged, assuming a certain coolness toward her. Make yourself comfortable, he said, pointing to an empty chair on the other side of the screen door. How about a beer? No, thank you, she declined. Then, opening her attaché case, she took out a manila envelope from which she extracted a sheaf of papers, she was having a bit of difficulty juggling the attaché case, the envelope, and the papers, and her concern about appearing to be all business made her nervousness show. Rack leaned against the wall and folded his arms, making no effort to interfere. If she was one of those uptight bureaucrats from the academic world, she wasn't about to change, he thought, and the less he had to do with her, the better. If, on the other hand, she was just a little unsteady on her feet, like a young calf, She'd find her legs soon, and they'd get along just fine. Reading from the papers in her hand, she said, You submitted blood samples, urine tests, and a smear. That's right. Seeing that he made no effort to move anything but his eyeballs, 
Diane made a wry face and shoved the papers at him. Why don't you look these over? she snapped. You've got a very serious problem on your hands. Rack took the papers, tossed them on a table alongside the chair Diane had refused to take, and said, Well, why don't you tell me what kind of a problem? If you're worried about quarantining, she paused and looked at one of the sheets she still held in her hand, then continued, The Colby Ranch, that won't be necessary, at least not from our preliminary findings. Her words acted like a spark that triggered Mayor Connors into life. That's great, he exclaimed, breaking into a wide smile. Best news I've heard all day. And so now, if you don't mind, I'll head back into town. Got some county fair business to take care of. Then, assuming the old campaign manner again, he seized Diane's hand, pumped it vigorously, assured her he was delighted to have met her, and hastened to his car. Over his shoulder he bid farewell to Jean and Rack. Jean Smith seemed to have taken a fresh interest in the proceedings, and leaning forward he said, "'Pardon me for intruding, ma'am, but do you mind telling me just what that cow died of?' Looking him squarely in the eye, she declared, "'Venom, a massive dose of venom. Red corpsicles were almost non-existent.' "'What?' demanded Rack, a look of genuine skepticism coming over his face. "'Are you trying to tell us that calf died of a snake-bite?' Not at all, replied Diane smoothly. I'm telling you that the calf died of spider venom. Rack looked incredulous. Spider venom, he repeated. He looked at the sheriff, who just shrugged his shoulders, rose from his chair, and pulled the screen door open. I'm going in to get me another beer, he muttered noncommittally. Rack turned his attention back to Diane. You're serious, aren't you? he demanded, half frowning. You want me to believe that a fair-sized calf was brought down by a spider? "'Come on, now.' "'Frankly, Dr. Hansen, I don't particularly care what you believe,' said Diane tartly, gathering up her papers and returning them to the attaché case. "'However, I would like to count on your cooperation, your full cooperation. I'd also like to examine the carcass and visit the Colby Ranch as soon as possible.' "'As far as the carcass goes,' announced Rack, "'it's in the freezer. We can go out to the Colby place in the morning.' That will be fine, she said as she punctuated the remark by snapping the lock on her attaché case before turning to leave. Then, as an afterthought, she added, I'm staying at... But then you know where I'm staying, since you were thoughtful enough to direct me there. Rack grinned in spite of himself. He glanced at his wristwatch. How would you like to have some dinner tonight? he asked. From the foot of the steps, she replied, Chances are I probably will. I'll see you in the morning, Doctor. With that, she turned without smiling and headed at a brisk pace toward her car. The sheriff emerged from the house as she finished talking and watched her admiringly as she returned to the M.G. He took a swig of beer and wiped his mouth with his shirt sleeve as Rack said, Not half bad, huh, Jean? Maybe so, if you could put a muzzle on her, was the reply. By the time Diane Ashley drove away from Rack Hansen's place and parked her car at Washburn's Lodge, night had fallen. The penetrating warmth of the late afternoon sun gave way to a crisp, cool chill. The temperature would probably drop down to the forties before the night was over. Diane decided to change into something a bit warmer before dinner. Glancing at her watch, she saw that she had a good forty minutes before dinner was served. As she walked back to her cabin, she wondered if perhaps she should have accepted Rick's dinner invitation. Who knows, she thought, maybe underneath that insufferable macho exterior there lurks a reasonable human being. But it was too late now. She would have ample time to find out tomorrow. Besides, what difference did it really make? After a few hours of routine work, she would be on her way back to the university at Tempe, and in all probability that was the last she would ever see of this rural horse doctor and his town. After freshening up, Diane made her way to the main entrance of the lodge. Warm amber light emanated from the windows and smoke curled up from the chimney. She could smell an occasional whiff of burning wood, and it made her long for the coziness of a winter evening. An unexpected gust of wind made her shiver slightly, and she made up her mind to have a drink or two before dinner. The main reception area of the lodge was a bright, cheerful, friendly place that served as a combination lounge, bar, and dining room. At the far end of the room was a huge open fireplace with a roaring blaze. 
Filling an entire wall opposite it was a small but well-stocked bar, presided over by Emma Washburn, who appeared to be enjoying herself as much as the patrons. Diane surveyed the rustic interior and decided that it had a genuine lived-in quality to it, thanks, no doubt, to its proprietress. Considering the isolation of the place, Diane thought, it was surprising to see so many people present. But then it occurred to her that in the wilderness people tended to come from long distances all around to gather at an oasis, and this was most assuredly an oasis. Sliding into an empty seat at the uncrowded part of the bar, Diane smiled at Emma, who came right over to greet her. "'So, how'd you make out on your first day in town?' she asked, adding wryly, "'If you call it a town. Meet up with Rack?' "'Yes,' Diane replied noncommittally. Then, forcing a pleasant expression, said, "'And I met the sheriff, too. He seemed like a very nice man.' Emma gazed off into space, and a reflective expression crossed her features. "'Ah, that Jean Smith,' she said softly. "'We used to be, well, pretty close.' "'And now?' asked Diane, smiling. Emma looked down and began wiping the bar with a cloth. Assuming a resigned, matter-of-fact tone, she said, "'Now we're... different. Kind of friends. Long time ago, June used to be one hell of a man with the ladies.' But now all he needs to see him through the night is a case of beer. I guess I kind of wore him down. She put the rag away, leaned forward on her elbows, flashed to Diane a whimsical smile, and added as an afterthought, It's kind of sad when a man's main interest in life moves up to his stomach. Diane burst into a hearty laugh. It was the first time she had let her hair down since arriving. She heard the sound of a man coughing behind her as if he was choking on something, Turning around, she saw a slight, balding, middle-aged man seated at a table with a plain, rather embarrassed-looking woman, who was obviously his wife. Despite his discomfort, there was a decidedly mirthful expression on his face. Emma grinned at him, immediately catching on to the fact that he had reacted to her last remark. "'You nice people didn't meet, did you?' she said. "'Diane Ashley, this is Vern and Betty Johnson.' They just drove up in that fancy motorhome you seen outside, all the way from Nebraska. They're here for the county fair. Diane remembered seeing the vehicle when she returned from Rack's earlier, and thinking to herself as she parked alongside that it reminded her of a Boeing 707 beside a Piper Cub. Vernon sprang to his feet and extended a hand to Diane. Colorado, he declared, clearing his throat. We're from Colorado. "'Nice to meet you, Miss Ashley.' "'Nice to meet you,' she returned, smiling back. "'Colorado, Nebraska,' muttered Emma, shaking her head in mock disdain. "'If it ain't Arizona, it's all the same.' "'You saw my motor home out there, huh?' he asked, clearly eager to talk about it. Forty thousand dollars worth.' His wife, Betty, looked a little embarrassed and tried to change the subject. "'I understand that you're a scientist,' she said to Diane. "'You know, you and Vern have a lot in common.' Diane raised an eyebrow. "'Oh, really?' she said. Vernon beamed and puffed up like a pigeon. "'That's how I make all my money,' he announced. "'Kind of scientific-like, you know, through chemicals.' Diane brightened. "'You're a chemist?' she inquired. "'Oh, no,' interjected Betty. "'You don't understand. He invented a new kind of chemical toilet, the kind they use at construction sites.' Diane and Emma exchanged amused glances, hastening to avoid any prolonged eyeball contact in order to keep from losing control and bursting into laughter. The exchange was completely lost on the Johnsons, especially Vern, whose eagerness to be friendly with Diane did not appear to score him any extra points with his wife. "'Can I buy you a drink, Miss Ashley?' he asked. "'A pretty woman like you shouldn't be drinking all by herself.' "'No, thank you, Mr.' And Mrs. Johnson, she replied, with emphasis on the Mrs. I've got a very busy day tomorrow. The full extent of my dissipation tonight's going to have to be a sandwich in my room and a hot glass of milk before bed. Turning and tossing a fast wink at Emma, she gathered up her things, looked back at Vern, and added with all the innocence she could muster, But I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Johnson. The next time I sit down on a chemical toilet...
I'll certainly be thinking of you. Good night. Then, turning back to Emma, she said, Could I have a seven o'clock call, please? Sure thing, hun, Emma assured her. Sleep well now. After making arrangements to have dinner sent to her cabin, Diane went directly to it and switched on the lights. It would be at least half an hour before her dinner arrived, just enough time for her to take a shower. After locking the door, she undressed, hung her clothes in the closet, and went into the bathroom. Although she had not noticed anything at the time, when she put her boots into the closet, there was a slight movement in the corner. A large black spider, disturbed by the intrusion, scurried out into the room, stood for a moment surveying the scene, its hairy forelegs waving as if feeling for some unseen vibrations. Then, crossing the room to the dresser, it scuttled up one side and started across the top. It moved over towards the front edge and stopped again, raising its forelegs and waving them in the air. Then it continued walking and disappeared into a partially open drawer. Finished with her shower, Diane emerged from the bathroom wrapped in a large towel. Going to the closet, she took out a floor-length dressing gown and slipped into it. Then she rummaged around in her suitcase on the rack at the foot of the bed for her hairbrush. She went over to the dresser and sat down to contemplate herself in the mirror as she brushed her hair. When she had finished, she lay the brush on the dresser and casually pulled the drawer open to get some cologne that she had put there earlier. Suddenly she stopped and stared into the drawer, her hand poised in midair. There, motionless except for its gently weaving forelegs, was the spider that had taken refuge in the drawer earlier. Breaking into a smile, Diane gently put her hand into the drawer, and with the other one nudged the spider into crawling onto her palm. Slowly, deliberately, she raised it to eye level, studied it for a moment, and murmured, "'What are you doing in there? You're not supposed to be in people's houses. You're supposed to live in the ground.' Then, crossing over to the cabin door, Diane opened it, stepped outside, and bent over, carefully putting the spider on the ground. "'Go on,' she said to it in a tone that one might assume in addressing a recalcitrant child— Go and build yourself a burrow someplace. Go on. Off you go. Without another thought, she turned back into the cabin and closed the door behind her. The spider made a little semicircle and stood still so that it was now facing the door. It was motionless, save for the forelegs, which rose up and waved slowly back and forth. A ray of light from under the door jamb of the cabin caught its surface, and it gleamed like a black diamond. It was as if the creature was deliberately watching, studying, and digesting information. Chapter 5 Walter Colby stepped off the back porch of his house and glanced impatiently at his watch. 8.30 a.m. and not a sign of his dog, old Jake. He put the finger of his right hand to his mouth and let out an ear-splitting whistle. Damn, he muttered to himself. What's that dog up to now? Just then, his wife, Birch, appeared in the doorway with a basket of laundry under one arm. "'Still no sign of Jake, huh?' she asked. Colby tapped his pipe bowl against the side of the house. "'Fool dog,' he complained. "'Always said he was too stupid to find his way home.' The sound of an approaching vehicle distracted both of them at the same moment. "'Here comes company,' observed Birch. "'That'll be Rack.' said Walter, breaking into a slow trot and heading down to meet the oncoming truck. It had pulled up and come to a stop in less than a minute. Rack jumped out, followed by Diane, who looked as though she was ready to run an obstacle course. She wore fairly heavy boots, a no-nonsense khaki jumpsuit, and she carried a black leather work kit that resembled a physician's bag. "'You hear from the university yet?' asked Walter eagerly. Rack nodded. Walter, I'd like you to meet Diane Ashley. Ms. Ashley's with the venomous animals section at the university in Tempe. Walter looked plainly surprised. He had expected to see some bespectacled, bewhiskered old codger in Bermuda shorts and a pith helmet. Diane, half suspecting what was going through his mind, extended her hand to him and said, I'm sorry to hear about your calf, Mr. Colby. From what I could see, it was a fine-looking animal. At that moment, Birch came running up behind them. She was breathing hard, and her face was drawn and alarmed-looking. "'Old Jake's been killed, Colby,' 
He spun around, frowning. What are you talking about, woman? She nodded her head in the direction from which she had come. Out behind the house, she said. We'd better take a look, suggested Rack, and without further conversation all four of them started for the back of the house. Between them and the dead dog was a cow that stood there bellowing loudly. Move it, cow, yelled Colby, and he whacked it on the flank with the flat of his hand. It moved away and they drew around to look at the carcass. It was bloated and stiff. Oh, God, gasped Birch, reaching out and putting her arm around her husband's waist, as Rack and Diane knelt down to examine the dead dog. Rack checked the eyes and the mouth as Diane opened her work kit, took out a syringe and several vials. Expertly extracting a blood sample and transferring it to one of the vials, she added a few chemicals and shook vigorously. Then she examined it again. Rising to her feet, she turned and faced the Colbys. Colbys should not have an apostrophe S. It's, uh, whatever. It would appear, she said, that this dog died the same way the calf did. Walter Colby dropped his arms and clenched his fists. I guess the next step now is to destroy my stock, huh? He hesitated and looked from Diane to Rack and back to Diane again. Might as well put a gun to my head while you're at it, he added bitterly. Your stock isn't dying from any sort of plague or bacterial infection, Mr. Colby, Diane assured him. Both of these animals died of massive injections of spider venom. She turned and indicated the dog with her hand. Why, there's enough venom in that dog to kill him four times over. There you go again, snapped Rack impatiently. There's no way a spider can kill a dog, let alone a full-grown cow. Maybe one can't, she retorted, turning to face him. But what about a hundred? Wait a minute, interrupted Colby. Maybe that explains the spider hill. Spider hill, demanded Diane. What do you mean, Mr. Colby? Colby scratched his head and made a face. Damnedest thing you ever saw, he began. Found it this morning while I was looking for my dog. Watched it for almost an hour. Hundreds of a minute, near as I can tell, and I don't remember seeing it a week ago. Rack and Diane exchanged worried glances. Rack said, Let's have a look at it, Walt. Colby nodded. Just follow me, he said. It's over yonder in the west field. They followed him single file for about five minutes, and soon they were facing a huge dirt mount approximately three feet high and about six feet in diameter. Roughly conical in shape, the top was flat, and along the sides at regular intervals were baseball-sized holes. At the top, standing on the flat part of the cone, were three gigantic tarantulas waving their antennae back and forth. Dude, tarantulas don't have antennae. <laughs> anyway, at the approach of the four people, they scurried down the sides and vanished into the holes. See what I mean? said Colby. What do you make of that? I'm seeing this, but I just don't believe it, exclaimed Diane, taking a Minox camera from her bag. I've never seen anything like this before. What about you, Hanson? She began moving around the hill, shooting it from all angles, as Rack said. Beats the hell out of me. Kind of gives you the creeps, doesn't it? How many you figure are in there? God, gasped Diane. It's hard to tell. Judging from the size of this hill, it could run into the thousands. That's just a guess, though. Suddenly, Colby bent over, picked up a long, formidable piece of wood, and started for the hill. You want to know how many's in that hill? He snarled. I'll show you how many's in that damn hill. Rack ran after him and grabbed him by the arm. Hold on there, Walt, he demanded sternly. Give the lady a chance. Just then, Diane rounded the hill and, without taking her eyes from it, called back, Mrs. Colby, do you suppose you could get me a couple of mason jars with lids? Sure, she said, watching her husband and hesitating until he nodded his approval. Then she turned and headed back toward the house. Diane, meanwhile, put her Minox away and began scanning the ground until she could find a long, thin stick. "'What's she doing, anyway?' asked Colby. "'We'll see soon enough,' answered Rack. Going over to the hill, she knelt down and began poking around with the stick. Then getting to her feet, but remaining crouched near the ground, 
She started heading back to where Rack and Colby stood. Colby's eyes widened with renewed respect. She was prodding a huge tarantula with the stick and forcing it to go exactly where she wanted it. By maintaining a certain amount of pressure with the stick, she prevented it from moving unless she permitted it. Rack squatted down to take a better look at the creature. Want me to get a man out here to spray some DDT? he asked. Diane frowned and studied the spider closely for a moment before answering, then said, No, I don't think the DDT will kill them. Most spiders, especially the big ones, become immune to it. The only thing the DDT will kill is their food. It's got to be something to do with the killing off of their food. She lowered her voice. Can you get Colby to let the hill alone until I can do some checking? Rack nodded. I can get him to do that for a little while, but not for too long, though. The man's got everything he owns tied up in these cows. Diane didn't answer. She appeared too absorbed in what she was doing. Holding the tarantula down with a stick, she cautiously reached down with her other hand and picked it up, examining it minutely from all angles. It's antennae... Oh, God damn it! Antennae again, and... It... It's is spelled I-T apostrophe S. Come on, book. You're killing me, man. You're killing me. Okay... Let me just read these fucking words. Its antennae vibrated furiously, and the legs wriggled in desperation. Amazing, she murmured. This little guy here is about 600 miles north of where he should be. You call that monster little? exclaimed Rack. She did not get a chance to answer because at that moment Birch Colby arrived with the mason jar. Taking one look at the spider in Diane's hand, she shuddered, handed the jar to Rack, and drew back. Thanks, Birch, he said. Oh, my God. Thanks has an apostrophe S. Jesus. Okay. Sorry. Thanks, Birch, he said. I sure hope these things don't get into the house, Birch declared, another shudder rippling over her frame. They give me the creeps. Diane carefully slipped the spider into the jar and screwed on the lid, then, looking at Walter, said... If it's all right, Mr. Colby, I'd like to examine the area where the first animal died. Why not? Colby answered, a note of resignation in his voice. Rack glanced at his watch. Walt, he asked, could you run Miss Ashley, I mean, Ms. Ashley, over to Emma's when she's done? I'm half an hour late seeing my girl. Then turning to Diane. Oh, look, I know you're going to have dinner tonight. Why don't we do it together this time? It seems to me we both have very busy schedules, she replied coolly. Rack shrugged, opened his mouth as if he was about to say something, then apparently thinking better of it, turned to Colby and said, oh, Walt, you do what the lady says about things. She knows what she's talking about. In fact, it might also be a good idea to move all your stock as far away from this area as possible. He turned to leave and walked a few steps, then halted and looked back. Diane was watching him and looked a bit embarrassed, like a small child who had been caught doing something forbidden. He grinned broadly and waved. I see you around, spider lady, he called cheerfully. As he drove out to his sister-in-law Terry's place, Rack kept thinking about Diane. Although he had no intention of springing it on her, the old cliché, what's a nice girl like you doing in a business like this? kept running through his head. He grinned to himself as he concentrated on the long ribbon of road unwinding ahead. It just proves you still can't judge a book by its cover, he thought. The last thing he would ever have guessed had he met her under any other circumstances was that she was a serious scientist, and for that matter, one for whom he had learned very quickly to develop a healthy professional respect. The way she handled herself back at the Colby place was really something. There were a lot of hard-as-nails men he could think of who would just as soon walk barefoot into a pit of live rattlesnakes before they would handle tarantulas the way she did. Now if he could only break through that wall of uptight propriety and get her to let down her hair, maybe their working relationship might take a turn for the better. And for that matter, he thought, who knows? Maybe even another kind of relationship might develop. And this, ladies and gentlemen, 
in a nutshell, is what women working in scientific fields have to deal with on a daily basis, even today in 2016. Now, granted, this was the 70s, and the 70s is arguably a few steps behind us, but Jesus fucking Christ. Anyhow, and editorial. The ranch that Rack's brother John had built from scratch was a small spread, but manageable, and Terry was doing a first-rate job. She was an attractive woman, and Rack was more than casually fond of her, but the spark that was needed to make it any more than that was missing. He wished she wouldn't keep pushing him the way she did. After all, he was only human, and he had no intention of starting anything that could ever be more than a physical relationship. He sighed as he pulled into the driveway leading to the ranch house. If it weren't for his niece, Linda, he wouldn't spend half the time around here that he did but she was still too young to be without a father figure, even if only on a part-time basis. As Rack climbed out of his truck, not twenty-five feet from the front door of the house, Linda, a pretty little six-year-old, dressed in a pinafore, came bounding across the porch. She nearly flew down the steps, her arms outstretched, her face wreathed in a smile. "'Uncle Rack! Uncle Rack!' she cried. Bending down to meet her, Rack seized her playfully, raised her in the air, and seated her down on the hood of his truck. "'How's my little girl?' he asked, in a tone that implied heartfelt concern. "'Great,' she replied, before allowing her face to scrunch up in a frown, then declaring mournfully, "'Except for my cat, he ran away.' "'Ah, he'll be back,' Rack assured her. "'He's a tomcat, and they like to prowl around.' Not unlike some other people I know, interjected Terry, who had just come up behind Rack. We still going on the picnic tomorrow? Linda asked, a note of apprehensive uncertainty in her voice. Giving her a big hug, he looked over at her mother and smiled, adding, You think I'd miss a chance to be with the prettiest little girl in the state of Arizona? He paused, and she looked up at him, her eyes dancing with delight as she awaited his answer. Not on a bet, I wouldn't, he declared. Uncle Rack, she said, suddenly changing the subject, do you want to listen to my new Uncle Remus record? Can't think of anything I'd like better, he said convincingly. Why don't you go set it up and I'll be with you in a minute? I'll get it ready right away, she promised, sliding down from the hood of the truck and skipping off to the house. Terry moved closer to Rack, put her hand on his arm, and said softly, her eyes downcast, I'm sorry about what happened the other day, Rack. He gently brought her head to his and gave her a peck on the cheek, muttering, I don't know what you're talking about, lady. Then, reaching into an inner jacket pocket, he took out an envelope and handed it to her. Terry took it, glanced at it for a moment, then back at Rack fixing him with a smoldering look that was beyond misinterpretation she said huskily you're a funny man rack you won't be with your brother's wife but you take care of her like you were isn't that kind of like buying the cow and giving away the milk assuming an air of mock severity rack pointed his forefinger at terry's nose and lowered his voice to a confidential level you're going to keep pestering me like that little girl he told her, and one of these morning I might just show up and milk the cow. Punching him lightly in the chest, she said, Just make sure your hands are warm. Chapter 6 Late that afternoon, after having made several emergency calls, Rack found himself tooling along the main road with the vague idea of stopping by Emma Washburn's to see if he could catch up with Diane Ashley. He tried to convince himself that his motives were purely professional, but deep down he knew otherwise. The shadows were growing longer, and the mountains in the distance had begun to turn purple as the rainbow-hued Arizona sky prepared for its nightly light show. The road was singularly deserted, and for no particular reason Rack found himself picking up speed. He always did that when there was no one in sight. He'd been doing it since he first started driving as a teenager. It was a vestige of the mischievous kid lurking inside of him, the kid who got a kick out of getting away with something he knew was not quite within the confines of the law. The speedometer needle was now pushing 80 mph and climbing. Rack grinned. 
The old Bronco still had plenty of steam left. He looked ahead on the road and noticed that he was gaining on another vehicle. The distance between them narrowed rapidly, and it suddenly occurred to Rack that the car he was about to pass was none other than Diane Ashley's red MG. Now, that's what I call luck, he muttered to himself. Then, shifting his weight in the seat, he leaned forward, decelerated just enough to pass, and break abruptly without causing a smash-up. As he cut Diane off, she slammed on her brakes and peered out nervously, not quite understanding what had happened. When she recognized Rack as he got out of his truck and headed toward her with a big grin, she frowned, trying as best she could to display annoyance. "'You certainly have a convenient way of showing up, don't you?' she huffed as he sauntered over to her car. "'Guess I am kind of handy like that,' he agreed, leaning against the side of her car. She craned her neck and peered ahead at the Bronco, which was now off the road on the shoulder. "'What?' she inquired, feigning deep surprise. "'No, girl, friend. What's the phrase they use out here in the wide open spaces? "'A little wham, bam, thank you, ma'am?' Rack rubbed his jaw and shook his head thoughtfully. "'No,' he explained. "'She was into Uncle Remus, and I wasn't.' Diane wrinkled her brow in bewilderment. "'I beg your pardon?' she asked. "'Where are you going?' Rack asked, abruptly changing the subject and adopting a tone that was just a degree short of gruff. "'Dinner,' replied Diane, momentarily caught off guard, then adding imperiously, "'Not that it should be any concern of yours.' "'Okay,' announced Rack authoritatively, indicating his intention with a nod of his head. "'Scoot over.' "'What did you say?' "'I said, scoot over. You heard me. "'I'll do no such thing.' Without ceremony or warning, Rack reached down into the car, picked Diane up, and dumped her into the passenger seat. Then he took his place behind the wheel. What the hell do you think you're... She turned livid. Buckle up for safety, honey, he ordered, releasing the brake and shifting into first. Please, he added as an afterthought as the car lurched forward. I am taking you to dinner, so you might as well get used to the idea. By the time they had pulled into the parking lot alongside the restaurant, it occurred to Rack that they had been conversing with almost complete amiability from the moment he had gotten into Diane's car. Although she wasn't prepared to own up to it just yet, Diane was quite pleased with the unexpected turn of events. The prospect of exchanging a less than scintillating array of homely bon mots with the likes of Vern and Betty Johnson back at Emma Washburn's had not especially appealed to her. Maybe Rack Hansen was a trifle too cool and sure of himself, but at least he wasn't dull company. Besides, the view from their window table was magnificent, since the restaurant sat atop a plateau overlooking the panoramic green vista of Verde Valley below. Making his way through a small cluster of people, Charlie Hodges, the owner of the place, came over to the table and asked if they wanted anything to drink. Diane had started to reply, but then on second thought glanced at Rack. "'What would you like?' he asked. She patted the back of his hand and said condescendingly, "'Whatever you order is just fine with me, honey pie.' "'Bring us two beers, will you, Charlie?' Hodges started to leave, but Diane stopped him. "'His taste is impeccable,' she confided. Then to Rack she said, "'Would a glass offend you, or should we just drink them out of the can?' Charlie laughed and headed back to the bar, past the busboy, who was carrying a huge plastic container of garbage out to where the trash was dumped. It was situated in such a way as to be out of the patron's view, even from the parking area. Glancing surreptitiously at the closed kitchen door, the boy went into the fenced-off dump area, put the container down alongside him, sat down on it, and reached behind his ear. Taking out a thin, expertly rolled joint, he lit up and took a deep, lung-filling drag, closing his eyes and rolling his head back to within inches of the fence that enclosed the dump. Had he moved back any further, he would have made contact with a large tarantula that stood there motionless, except for its antennae, Ugh. except for its antennae, which were raised above its head, waving back and forth in a slow, rhythmic motion. Motherfucker, you motherfucker.
At the prospect of colliding with the busboy's head, the huge, hairy spider scuttled swiftly to one side, then remained still again, contemplating him with its gleaming, unblinking eyes. Upon finishing off his joint, the youth lifted the trash container and flung its contents into the dump. A shower of partially eaten chicken, fish bones, lobster claws, potato skins, beef bones, and other debris went cascading into the metal bin provided for them. Then replacing the cover on the container, he sat down on it again and stared out over the trees and back at the rich reds and oranges of the gathering sunset. As he stood there, Trent... He was sitting. I thought he was sitting. Now he's standing there. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> As he stood there, transfixed by the vivid richness of the Verde Valley sunset, he was totally oblivious of what was beginning to occur in the reeking pile of garbage just below his line of sight. Slowly, almost unnoticeably at first, it began moving. Even the casual observer would have thought nothing of it, but then the movement increased. Bones began shifting, sliding as if they had mysteriously acquired a new life of their own. Half-eaten pieces of meat slithered over trembling eggshells. Gravy-spattered potato skins, wilted lettuce fragments, fish heads, and fragmented vegetables in an assorted melange of disagreeable refuse. Hairy insect legs began emerging from the disgusting heap on the top, on the sides, at the base, from all angles. Editorial. Those can't be spiders, then, because spiders aren't insects. They're arachnids. And editorial. These were followed by quivering antennae. Oh, fuck you. <sighs> These were followed by quivering antennae, waving back and forth as if to shake loose the slop that had nearly inundated them moments before. Now the bodies and more hairy, jointed legs appeared, until in moments the entire pile of garbage was literally crawling with hideous, scuttling tarantulas. There were so many, in fact, that by virtue of their numbers they made an eerie, squishy sound as they emerged from the depths of the heap of garbage. A strident clatter of crockery from inside the kitchen roused the boy from his stoned reverie, and he turned to go back inside. Just as he reached the kitchen door, the chef, a large bull of a man, loomed up, filling the doorway. His face was red and covered with beads of sweat. "'Where's the trash can, boy?' he snarled. The busboy looked down at the ground, realizing that he had forgotten to bring it back. The chef angrily spat a stream of tobacco juice, passed the youth and glared at him. "'You ain't worth doodly shit, boy. Get your ass in that trash bin and get me that plastic barrel back.' Then, whirling around, he stormed back into the kitchen. The boy, reacting automatically, went back to the trash bin and stopped short of the enclosed area, the rising stench from the garbage heap assailing his cannabis-heightened senses. Making a wry face, he glared at the kitchen door and called out, Get it yourself, you big fat turd. Then he turned and headed towards the parking lot, just as an immense tarantula on the top of the fence of the enclosure had begun inching toward the direction of his head. The creature watched him until he disappeared around the building, then it moved back and scuttled down the back side of the fence into the garbage pile. Inside the restaurant, Rack and Diane were awaiting the arrival of their beer. Tell me, said Rack. How did it go out at Colby's today? But before she had a chance to answer, he added as an afterthought, I've got to tell you, though, I'm still a little skeptical about your spider theory. Making no effort to conceal her annoyance, Diane retorted, Would you be less skeptical if a man had told it to you? Touché, Diane. In an attempt to mollify her, he reached over and put his hand on her arm. Look, he said, I think the only one upset about your being a woman is you. I may have my doubts about your theory, but not about you. If you must know, I called Tempe and checked you out. In your field, they told me there's no better. She was inwardly gratified, but she wasn't quite prepared to let Rack off the hook too easily. Slipping her arm out from under his hand, she raised an eyebrow and tossed him a cynical look, saying... What's that supposed to be? Cowboy psychology? <laughs>
Rack was prevented from answering directly by the arrival of the waiter with their drinks. He wordlessly poured their beer and left them alone. Rack grinned, picked up his glass in the gesture of a toast, and said, To women's liberation. To Gary Cooper, parried Diane, clinking her glass against Rack's, and taking a sip. Then, putting her glass down again, she cocked her head slightly and said, By the way, how the hell did you ever get a name like Rack? He took a sip of his beer and stared out the window, a faraway look coming into his eyes. I had a brother two years younger than me, he said quietly. Pool-playingest son of a bitch you ever did see in your life. He never worked as a kid, and I did, so I'd make fun of him for it, and tell him I'd always have the money on weekends to take the girls out. He smiled wistfully, and shook his head slightly as he continued. And I'll be damned if every Friday night he didn't get me into a game of pool and beat me out of every nickel I'd made all week. He'd laugh like hell and tell me to rack em. Pretty soon, they were all calling me Rack. It was just one of those names that stuck. Does he live around here? asked Diane casually. Rack lowered his eyes and stared at his drink. Uh, no, he replied softly, his words measured and precise. He died in Nam. Second day he was there. The jeep he was riding in hit a landmine. He never had a chance. Rack stopped talking and drained his glass. Then, looking at Diane and trying to manage a smile, he said, That girl I told you I had to see was his little daughter. I kind of look after her and her mother. Diane began to thaw and returned Rack's smile. Again he reached out, this time putting his hand on hers. She made no effort to pull away this time, and Rack became unexpectedly serious. Look he said. Supposing that your reports are a hundred percent right and both of those animals were killed by spider venom, what I'd like to know is why in the hell any spiders should suddenly turn aggressive towards livestock. The little bit I remember about venomous spiders from college is that they're basically loners, cannibals. If there's nothing else to eat, they'll kill and eat each other. The imaginary light bulb appeared over Diane's head. Her eyes widened. She pulled back her hand and snapped her fingers. Food! she exclaimed. Oh, I'm sorry, apologized Rack. You want to order now? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all, she shot back, her face flushed with excitement. I'm saying that food could be a principal reason for the attacks on the cattle. She seemed so worked up, Rack thought, that any second she would spring up from her chair. She went on, What I mean is that through the excessive use of insecticides like DDT, were inadvertently killing off the spider's natural source of food. In order to survive, the spiders, as well as other insects, are having to readjust their eating habits, and, in doing so, are evolving into more aggressive creatures. If that's the case, inquired Rack, how the hell do we get rid of them? The pictures I took today might give us a clue, suggested Diane. I'd like to get back and develop them as soon as possible. She reached for her handbag and began pushing her chair back, but Rack put a restraining hand on her arm. I'm all for that, he assured her, but not before we eat. Then, turning his head to catch the waiter's eye, he called out, Hey, Charlie! Diane relaxed and readjusted her chair. It was early, after all. There would be plenty of time to develop the films afterwards. Chapter 7 Several hours later, shortly after nightfall, as Rack and Diane were preparing to process the films she had taken out of the Colby's ranch, a heartbreaking scene was taking place. Linda, Rack's niece, stood on the back porch of her house with a small plate of cat food in her hand. Her eyes were moist with tears. Her pet had been gone two days, longer than he had ever strayed before and she missed him because he was soft and cuddly and playful. Peering out into the shadows, she called out plaintively, Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. How could she possibly know that she would never see her kitty again, that just a few feet from where she stood, beneath the steps to the porch, there was a large, whitish, featureless object 
that upon closer examination would appear to the observer to be roughly feline in shape. It was indeed the body of a dead cat, carefully preserved, meticulously wrapped in a fine, silken, mesh-like cocoon, bigger, thicker, and tougher than any cocoon ever to be seen in this part of the country before. Back at Washburn's Lodge, Diane's cabin now looked more like a photographic darkroom than a place for lodging. A small precision Minox enlarger was standing on the vanity table. The light bulbs had been removed from the bed lamp and replaced with a ruby-red safe light. Three stainless steel trays containing developer, shortstop, and fixative were aligned on the bathroom floor. Rack was busily engaged in developing and washing as Diane expertly checked the strip of negatives from which she was making her prints. "'This should be the last one, Rack,' she called. "'Glad to hear it,' he replied. "'If I stayed in this position much longer, I'd be a sure candidate for water on the knee.' "'How do they look so far?' she asked. "'So far, so good. All nice and clear as far as I can see in this light.' As Diane turned off the enlarger and handed the final undeveloped print to Rack, neither of them spoke. A few minutes later, after sloshing the print around in the hypo, he stood up and said, Okay, I guess we can throw some light on the subject now. Diane switched on the main overhead light, which automatically turned on the bathroom light. Let's just spread them out on the floor wet, she suggested. This way we can look at them all together. Blotting them first with a bath towel, as best they could, they quickly arranged the prints in several rows on the floor, and then got down on their hands and knees to examine them. Diane scrutinized each one intently. She was clearly looking for something specific. Rack wasn't exactly sure of what it was, but he had more than enough confidence in her. He could tell without doubt from the way she was examining each picture of the spider hills that she knew precisely what she was doing. "'This is the most incredible thing I have ever seen!' she exclaimed. "'I mean, this is an absolutely anomalous phenomenon.' "'What do you mean?' asked Rack, frowning. Diane shifted to a sitting position, facing Rack cross-legged alongside the array of wet prints. "'Well, as you know,' she began, "'all species of—oh, God. "'My gal—my galaday. "'We'll go, man. "'Well, as you know,' she began— all species of mygalidae are carnivorous and cannibalistic. Don't those bird-eating spiders in South America belong to that genus? He asked. She nodded her head. That's right. The, oh God, avicular, aviculariidae. That's right, the aviculariidae. Anyway, if you put two of them together in a confined space, they'll just kill each other off. They just don't colonize the way ants or bees do. She reached down for one of the prints, "'picked it up and handed it to Rack. "'Yet look at this picture,' she said. Two tarantulas working together,' he mused. "'She handed him another photograph, adding, "'And look at this one. "'These tarantulas aren't fighting at all.' "'Maybe they've been breeding with ants,' observed Rack dryly. "'Then, getting to his feet, he went over to the dresser "'and picked up one of the mason jars "'holding a specimen Diane had taken from the Colby's. "'Very funny,' muttered Diane, picking up the second jar and taking it into the bathroom. There she carefully took the tarantula from the jar, holding it in such a way as to avoid its fangs. Then, placing the creature over a jelly jar which had a piece of rubber cut from surgical gloves stretched drum-tight over the top, she punctured the fangs with the tip of a needle and forced them through the rubber over the jar. At that instant, the venom shot out and streamed down the sides of the glass, forming milky streaks. You know, she said as she continued milking venom from the spider, on a hunch today, I checked the local newspaper for ads about missing pets. Do you know that in the past three months, there have been over 30 ads for lost animals? Everything from cats to goats? After she finished milking the spider, Diane put it back into the mason jar and prepared several microscopic slides for lab analysis with smears of venom, packing them away very carefully in a foam rubber-padded steel sample case. First thing in the morning, she reflected, I want to send this to the lab for analysis. How about the spider hill at Walt's place? Rack asked. That was the only colony we saw out there. Maybe the best thing to do is just burn it. Rack rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Well, we'd better do it tonight before they can do any more damage. 
That's a good idea, agreed Diane. I just want to get this place straightened out a bit first, if you don't mind. There's nothing worse than coming home exhausted and having to clean up before bed. Who says you have to come back here at all tonight? said Rack, trying his best to be suggestive. And leave my spiders here all by their lonesome? she retorted. Come on, lend a hand. Walter Colby had been pacing nervously for some time before making his decision, but when he did he swung into action. In less than fifteen minutes he had filled two five-gallon cans with gasoline and had fashioned a torch from a heavy stick with tar and kerosene-soaked rags wrapped around one end. With a can in each hand and the unlighted torch tucked under one arm, he walked away from the house, resolved to take matters into his own hands. Watching him from the porch, his wife, Birch, called out, "'I hope you know what you're doing, Walt. That woman said for you to leave things alone.' Colby stopped in his tracks and turned to face Birch. "'That woman ain't trying to meet the mortgage payments,' he retorted, the anguish visible in his eyes. "'I'm going to end this problem once and for all.' The sound of truck tires crunching onto the dirt made Colby look toward the approach road. It was Rack's Ford Bronco, which came to a jerking stop about ten yards from where the rancher stood. He frowned as Rack and Diane jumped out and sprinted in his direction. I'm burning that damn spider hill, whether you like it or not, he called to them defiantly. You're not going to stop me. Calm down, Walt, shouted Rack. We're here for the same reason. We'll burn her down together. Colby heaved a sigh of relief, and he looked as though a big burden had been lifted from his shoulders. He waited for them to reach him and said, Maybe we ought to make up a couple of more torches. Not a bad idea, Walt, Rack agreed. A shovel might come in handy, too. Half an hour later, the three of them were making their way across the empty field toward the spider hill. A bright moon shone down from a cloudless starry sky, and the chirping of the crickets sounded so loud it seemed as though they were using amplifiers. Suddenly, without any advance warning, the chirping stopped abruptly. The silence was eerie. Rack paused, frowned, and looked around. "'What's the matter?' asked Diane in hushed tones. Rack shook his head. I don't know. It's just that the crickets stopped and... Diane shuddered. God, she interrupted. I never heard it so quiet. Now I know what they mean by a deafening silence. Oh, yes, put in Colby. Sometimes it gets so quiet out here you really could hear a pin drop. At that moment the silence was shattered by a frightening, unearthly bellowing like the sound of a thousand demons crying out from the depths of hell. "'Jesus Christ!' yelled Colby. "'Look out!' Looming out of the darkness, as if from nowhere, a huge enraged bull, roaring as it charged, came hurtling at them. It crashed through a fence, demolishing it completely, and bore down on them, hell-bent for trouble. "'Run!' shouted Rack, dropping his torch and grabbing Diane's hand. "'Thank you, Rack. Diane doesn't know how to run by herself.' "'Run!' shouted Rack, dropping his torch and grabbing Diane's hand. With the bull hard on their heels, bellowing like a banshee. Oh, God damn it. Banshees don't bellow, they shriek. Doesn't this writer know a goddamn thing about any goddamn thing? Jesus Christ, bellowing like a banshee. Fuck. <clears throat> With the bull hard on their heels, bellowing like a banshee, they spread across the moonlit sped. Not spread, although fuck it, who cares? We, we, are, we are being sucked into a vortex of words not meaning anything. With the bull hard on their heels, bellowing like a banshee, they sped across the moonlit field like a pair of Olympic runners, Walter slightly ahead and to their right. The bull roared again and again, its hooves thundering, its weight causing the ground to tremble. They were no match for the maddened animal as it bore down on them like an express train. Then, in a sudden move of desperation, Rack hurled himself at Diane, pushing her to one side. Down she went, pulling Rack with her as the two of them tumbled over. The bull careened past, missing them by inches. Veering off after Colby, who was beginning to stagger, the maddened beast suddenly stumbled, emitting an ear-splitting bellow as it somersaulted and thudded to the ground, where it lay still. Pulling the shaken Diane to her feet, Rack muttered, Let's get over there fast. 
They hurried over to the fallen bull, as Walter approached from the opposite direction, limping slightly and noticeably winded. Rack and Diane got there first. Rack dropped to one knee and examined one of the bull's eyes. He got up slowly and shook his head from side to side. There was no doubt from his expression that the animal was dead. Diane just stood there, staring at the lower part of the bull's body, her expression a mixture of horror and fascination. "'Take a look, Rack,' she gasped, pointing. He drew closer and stared down. The abdomen and hindquarter of the bull were crawling with bloated, thick, hairy spiders. Walter fell to his knees alongside the dead animal's head and stared in stunned silence a split second before Birch arrived from the house. She, too, stared in anguished disbelief. "'Saved for seven years to buy that bull,' she muttered softly on the verge of tears, helping her husband to his feet. He rose up slowly, the veins bulging at his neck, his eyes burning with rage. He trembled from head to foot. "'What's wrong?' demanded Birch, her face reflecting the alarm she felt. "'I'll be okay, woman,' he insisted. "'I'll be okay. Let's just go burn down that damn spider hill.' Then he stormed off without waiting for assistance, only one thought on his mind now. Revenge. Rack approached Birch. I'd get Walt into town if I were you, Birch. Looks as though he hurt his arm and it would be a good idea if you had a doctor take a look at it. As a matter of fact, suggested Diane, it might be a good idea if both of you went into town until we can isolate what's happening here. Are you crazy, woman? retorted Birch angrily. Who do you think's going to take care of this place? We ain't going nowhere. This is our home, and no damn spider is going to run us out. A low whooshing sound like that of a large gas burner being ignited could be heard, and the three of them turned to see a tower of flame shoot up from the spider hill. Colby's frame was outlined against the blaze, and he was shaking his right fist violently. His voice could be heard shouting at the top of his lungs, Burn! "'Burn in hell, you sons of bitches!' Rack turned to Diane and shook his head slowly. "'God,' he said. "'Losing that bull will break him for sure.' Diane seemed to be far away in thought. "'I don't mind telling you, Rack,' she confessed. "'But I'm getting a little scared. "'If they'll go after a fifteen-hundred-pound bull, "'what in hell's going to stop them from turning on us next?' Before Rack could answer, Colby's voice rang out again. Good riddance, you bastards. You'll never kill my stock again. Colby was feeling much better now as he stood there watching the flames consume the spider hill, the sight of their ugly, hairy bodies shriveling up as the fire reduced them to ashes made his heart beat with vengeful exultation. But between the darkness and his excitement, he had failed to notice that when he drenched the conical mound with gasoline, that there were not more than thirty or forty spiders crawling about its surface. Walter Colby was a rancher and farmer, not an expert on giant arachnids, whose behavior patterns confounded Diane Ashley, a recognized scientist. How, then, could Colby even begin to suspect anything about the altered nesting habits of these creatures that had invaded his property and ravaged his livestock? How could he know that even as he stood there, battalions of spiders were scurrying to safety down tunnels, making their way through a maze-like network of passageways beneath the sandy Arizona soil? At that very moment, before the flames had completely died down, trapdoors were springing open just beyond Colby's line of sight, and spiders were crawling out, thousands upon thousands of them, their venomous jaws working back and forth, their appetites growing by the hour. Chapter 8 The Colbys were early risers under ordinary circumstances, but circumstances had been far from ordinary since the invasion of their property by the spiders. They were physically and emotionally exhausted after the horrible death of the bull the night before, and though neither of them would admit it to the other, they retreated the next morning into the merciful, temporary oblivion of sleep. It was nearly 11 a.m. by the time they finished breakfast, and a good 15 minutes before Walter was ready to leave the house to take care of some business in a neighboring town. His right arm was very sore. He had strained the muscles in it while fleeing from the maddened bull last night, 
and Birch was uneasy about his driving. She frowned slightly. Why don't you let me drive into Cottonwood, she urged. He gave her an affectionate pat on the behind. I'll be fine, Birch, he assured her. I just need a little time to think. He paused and drew her face close to his. You know, he said softly, you're one hell of a good woman, lady. You know that? Now you get yourself in the house. I'm going to be just fine. He stopped talking and glanced apprehensively out toward the field, then back at his wife, adding, I want you to stay away from the field today, okay? She forced a smile and nodded a promise of assent, watching him as he climbed into the cab of his pickup truck and slammed the door shut behind him. For a brief instant, he thought he heard something behind him, and he turned around. There was nothing, and he started the engine. Who could blame him for being jumpy? he thought to himself. At about the time that Walter Colby was driving away from his ranch, Rack Hansen's Ford Bronco came to a stop in front of his sister-in-law's house. She was waiting on the porch with her daughter, Linda, whose face beamed with anticipation. She scampered over to the truck, just as Rack and Diane climbed out. At the sight of Diane, Terry Hansen tried to mask an expression of disappointment. Running up to Diane, grinning ear to ear, Linda blurted out an enthusiastic greeting. Hi, she said. I'm Linda Hansen. Are you Rack's new girl? Making a wry face, Rack gave his niece a flat-handed whack on the bottom. She's pretty, announced Linda, rubbing her backside while staring unabashedly at Diane, who replied, My, aren't you the extrovert? My name's Diane Ashley. At this juncture, Terry stepped forward and extended her hand to Diane. Hi, she said. I'm Terry Hansen. It's nice to meet you. Same here, replied Diane, clasping Terry's hand warmly. Come on out back, Diane, called out Linda, grabbing her free hand. I'll show you my swing. Her enthusiasm was all but overpowering, and Diane let herself be pulled away. Are you going to be in Camp Faraday long, Diane? asked Terry. It's hard to tell at this point, Terry, but it looks as if I might be here a while. Terry said nothing, and managed to maintain a slight frozen smile as Diane turned to Rack and said, I really shouldn't be playing hooky like this. What if my lab reports were to come in early? She glanced at Terry and added, Besides, I don't want to intrude. Don't be silly, interrupted Rack, coming between them and putting an arm around each woman's shoulder. Every Wednesday I take Linda on a picnic while Terry helps out of the general store. Sure, said Terry, with less than ardent enthusiasm. Welcome aboard. Let me go and get the food. Is it all right, Terry? asked Rack, glancing quickly from Diane, who by now had been dragged out back by the effervescent Linda. It's great. Super, insisted Terry unconvincingly. She seems like a real nice lady. Then, turning, she ran up the porch and into the house, unable to hold back her tears. It was a perfect day for a picnic. Deep blue sky overhead dotted with drifting fleecy puffball clouds. A gentle dry breeze and a magnificent desert landscape rimmed by distant mountains. Rack, with Linda seated in front of him, and Diane had ridden their horses to the crest of a hill which offered an ideal flat space on which to spread the blanket and set out the food. Linda was anxious to dismount and get down to the serious business of eating. Uncle Rack, I want to see what there is to eat, she said, as he helped her from her saddle. All kinds of good things, promised Diane. Rack climbed down from his horse and removed two picnic baskets from the saddle. Handing the folded blanket to Linda, he said, you spread that blanket out on the ground, right here. Can you do that? Of course I can, she asserted reproachfully, reaching out to take it from his hands, then proceeding to go about the task in a decidedly careful manner. Diane walked over to the edge of the bluff and stared down at the vast spread of desert stretched out below. Rack came over and stood beside her, contemplating the panoramic beauty of the eye-filling vista, and Diane said to him, this is really great. So peaceful. I never stop marveling. Except for the road down there, this has to look exactly as it must have hundreds of years ago. A solitary truck rattled along the lonely ribbon of road, and she watched it for a moment, then turned to Rack and smiled. That's Colby's truck down there, isn't it? 
But before he could say anything, she went on, Nice thing about this part of the world is that everybody knows everybody. Rack put his arm around her shoulder and smiled back. And there are a lot of people out here worth knowing. For a moment, neither of them said anything as they watched Colby's truck disappear around a curve, leading to a rise in the road. In his truck, Walter Colby stared ahead at the winding road as he bounced along, totally unaware that a huge tarantula had just crept to the top of the seat directly behind his neck. A curve in the road ahead placed him in the sun's full glare, and squinting, he reached up to flip down the sun visor. As he did so, a second tarantula, larger than the one behind him, leaped forward and attached itself to his face, its hairy legs fixing themselves in his eyelids, his nose, and forehead. Uttering a single, blood-curdling scream, he clawed at his face. A sharp, fiery pain stabbed him in the neck and below the right eye. He screamed again as he lost control of the truck and it began careening off the road. Suddenly, everything began to darken. He felt a numbness. The scene of the picnic up on the bluff couldn't have been more idyllic. Thoroughly oblivious of her surroundings, Linda played happily with her raggedy Ann doll and a small plastic sand bucket. As she chattered amiably to the doll, moving it about from one position to another, Rack and Diane were completely absorbed in one another. He lay stretched out, resting his head on his elbow, munching on a sandwich. Diane sat cross-legged beside him, doing the same. "'You know something?' he said lazily. I could do great things with a cold can of beer now, and I'm just too damn comfortable to go get it. Don't move, murmured Diane, reaching across him to the picnic basket behind his back. After opening the can and handing it to him, she leaned back as he took a sip. Tell me more about your brother, Rack, she asked. Well, Rack said with a sigh, he was a great guy. He died a week before Linda was born, so he never saw his own daughter. I've taken care of Terry and Linda ever since. How about you? Any ties? She shook her head. None at the moment. Any brothers or sisters? No, just me. Rack grinned. So you're a loner, he observed. No wonder you're used to getting your own way. Linda was still busily engaged in an intense, one-sided conversation with her doll, seated alongside her bucket just beyond a small clump of bushes. With an exaggerated frown, she wagged her finger at the doll. I told you no, she scolded. Mommy said you can't leave or the big bad wolf will eat you all up. There was a slight rustling in the leaves behind her, but the sound was too low to attract her attention. Nose to nose with the doll, she said, Now I want you to eat all your dinner and then you can go out and play. She paused to listen, then answered, Okay, dum-dum. The rustling in the bushes became stronger. Linda was still thoroughly absorbed in her games of make-believe. At that moment, the horses grew suddenly uneasy, stamping their feet, snorting and chomping at their bits. Rack and Diane looked up. Rack frowned and got to his feet. The horses were straining now, obviously terrified of something. Rack, having no intention of letting them panic, went over and did his best to calm them down. "'What's the matter, Rack?' Diane asked. "'I don't know,' he replied. "'But whatever it is, they're not happy about it, so I think the best thing for us to do is get moving.' He turned and called to his niece. "'Come on, Linda, we're leaving.' She picked up her doll and called, "'I'm coming,' then reached down for the sand bucket accidentally spilling its contents. Oh, darn, she exclaimed, then ran to join Rack and Diane, who were now packing the baskets and getting ready to ride home. The bushes beyond where Linda had been playing rustled again. The leaves closest to the ground parted, and from behind them emerged a tarantula, and another, and another. They stood watching, their antennae waving back and forth as... <laughs> They stood watching, their antennae waving back and forth, as still another emerged from the pile of dirt that had fallen from Linda's bucket. It, too, stood there, watching, its antennae twitching slowly, as Rack and Linda and Diane mounted their horses and began riding down the hill. There was more scurrying atop the bluff, 
and where the horses had been tethered about two dozen tarantulas now obliterated the imprints of their hoof-prints. Chapter 9 The rotating red lights atop the sheriff's car flashed trouble. On the other side of the road was a large camper on a truck bed. Standing alongside it were a deputy, Sheriff Smith, and the owners of the camper. Just ahead, a tow truck was parked, to the front of which two men were securing a long, heavy-duty rope. The sheriff had just arrived with the men in the tow truck, and his deputy was explaining to him exactly what had happened, as far as he could figure. Mr. Benson here says he was about a quarter of a mile behind him when it happened. All of a sudden his driving became erratic. He started zigzagging all over the road, and then a moment later he was over the side of the cliff. "'Hey, Gene,' called one of the men from the tow truck. "'We're all set here.' "'Just hold on a minute,' shouted back the sheriff. "'Let me get down there first. Then to the couple he said, "'Will you excuse me, please?' Turning, he walked over to the tow truck. He was just about to say something when he heard the sound of an approaching vehicle. It was Rack Hansen's Bronco. Rack pulled up alongside and looked out at the sheriff. "'Hi, Gene,' he said. "'You got a problem?' Smith jerked his thumb in the direction of the ravine that dropped sharply below the road. "'Truck went off the road down there,' he replied. "'I'm just wondering how to get down there without breaking my fool neck.' Rack switched off the engine and pulled on his emergency brake. "'Well, let's take a look, then.' And glancing at Diane, he said, "'You stay here with Linda, okay?' "'All right,' nodded Diane. Rack climbed out of the Bronco, went over to the sheriff, and together they began to make their way carefully over the edge of the road at the drop-off point and down into the ravine. It was steep, rocky, and treacherous. Loose rocks made the descent even more precarious, and they slid and stumbled as they went down, following the tire marks of the truck, down to where it lay at an angle, battered, partially burned, and still smoking. "'It's Walt Colby's truck!' exclaimed the sheriff as they drew alongside. Instead of answering, Rack reached out to open the door, but snatched his hand back the instant it made contact. The metal was too hot, and he grimaced as he examined his hand. "'Let's find a good heavy stick,' he suggested. For a few minutes, both he and Sheriff Smith looked around until Rack found what he was looking for. Using the stick as a lever, he wrenched and struggled until he finally succeeded in forcing the door to spring free. It crashed open, swinging back, as at the same moment the upper part of Walter Colby's body fell upside down at their feet. There were blood stains around his neck and shirt. Only part of his face was visible. The rest was covered by a shiny white cocoon. The one eye that was uncovered stared horribly out of its socket, and what could be seen of the face was frozen in a hideous grimace of terror. "'Jesus Christ!' gasped the sheriff, jumping back in horror. Rack felt a twinge of nausea in the pit of his stomach, not so much because of what he saw, but because of what he knew it meant. He barely heard the sheriff mutter something about having to call the coroner, and as he started back up the side of the ravine, he had to fight to keep from getting sick. Among other things, he knew that he and the sheriff were going to have to break the news of the tragedy to Birch, and he didn't relish the idea. "'I suppose you're going to want me to come with you when you see Birch, aren't you?' he said softly as they climbed. "'You can if you want to,' muttered the sheriff. "'But you don't have to. I'd take Linda home if I was you. Besides, I get paid to do jobs like that, like em or not.' Rack knew exactly what Gene Smith was saying. He had known him too long. Maybe he looked tough, especially when he had to be. But there was a side of him that was anything but tough. Rack knew that Gene knew he wasn't going to be able to break the news to Birch without showing how he felt. Rack also knew that Gene wasn't overly anxious for anyone beside Birch to see him when that difficult moment came. Rack was grateful to Gene, especially when they met later that afternoon for a beer. God, sighed the sheriff, covering up his discomfort. I'm glad you weren't there to hear her scream would have sent chills down your spine. They only had time for a fast one. Rack had to get over to his own office where Diane was waiting for him, 
and the sheriff had to go back to the Colby place for some unfinished business. The two men shook hands and drove off in their respective vehicles. As Rack pulled up in front of his office, Diane poked her head through the doorway and waved. He barely crossed the threshold when the phone rang. It was Mildred, the town telephone operator and central clearinghouse for all local gossip and information. "'Hi, Rack,' she began. "'I'm trying to locate Miss Ashley. She wasn't at the lodge, so if you hear from her, will you tell her she's got an urgent call from Flagstaff?' "'Just hold on, Mildred. She's right here.' Rack said hurriedly into the phone. He had to be fast, because Mildred had the habit of occasionally cutting people off before they had a chance to finish what they were saying when things got busy at the exchange. He handed the phone to Diane. Yes, she said. Yes, this is Diane Ashley. What? You're sure. Who ran the test? Okay, I'll keep you advised. Yes, certainly. Goodbye. And thanks. She replaced the receiver, furrowed her brow, then looked over at Rack. This is absolutely incredible, she declared. That spider venom I sent to my lab is almost five times its normal toxicity. What did you say? He retorted, a look of utter incredulity spreading over his features. The question was strictly rhetorical. He didn't really expect her to repeat herself. In any case, she had no opportunity... The telephone punctuated his question with a strident jangle, and he picked it up at once. "'Rack here,' he said tersely. His expression turned abruptly to one of alarm. "'You what?' he exclaimed. "'Absolutely, Jean. "'Right now?' "'Okay, we'll leave this minute.' Slamming the phone onto its cradle, he took Diane by the arm and headed for the door. "'Come on,' he announced. "'That was the sheriff. "'He's out at Birch's.' He found another twenty or thirty spider hills just like the ones we burned. Oh, my God, Diane gasped. Let's hurry. The interior of Rack's Bronco was sweltering from the heat of the afternoon sun, but as she slid into the seat alongside him, Diane shivered. I know I'm supposed to be scientifically objective about all this, she reflected as he kicked the engine over and threw the truck into gear. But this is unknown territory. First of all, this genus of spider shouldn't be here. They should be scuttling around in the jungles of South America, eating birds and rodents. And each other, volunteered Rack grimly. Now they're behaving like swarms of killer bees. Either they've undergone some kind of mutation, or a radical upset of the ecological balance has forced them to alter their habits. The truck rattled as the speedometer needle passed the 80 mph mark. Rack narrowed his eyes and tightened his grip on the wheel. Well, whatever it is that's happened to them... Gives me the creeps. They're acting too damned intelligent for my money. Diane nodded. I know, she answered softly. Rack continued. I can't help thinking about Walt, he said. Sure, it could be coincidence. His place was crawling with the ugly bastards. When he burned the hill, some of them could easily have gotten into his pickup. But what if... Diane put a hand over his... Let's wait until we have more concrete evidence to go on, she interrupted. There has to be a logical scientific explanation for all this. Yeah, sure, Rack muttered. Then they both fell silent as they watched the road before them. When Rack and Diane arrived at the Colby Ranch, they pulled up alongside the sheriff's car. He was standing beside it with Mayor Connors, who was frowning and wiping the sweat from his forehead with a dirty handkerchief. They approached the Bronco as Rack and Diane piled out, the mayor put his handkerchief away and mustered up a perfunctory official smile. Howdy, folks, he said. Glad you could make it so quick. He turned and nervously indicated the field with the spider hills with a nod of his head. I suppose the sheriff here told you what he found. Rack nodded. What do you think about it, mayor? he said. Connors puffed up as though he were about to make an address to the local Rotarians. There's only one thing to do he announced pontifically, and that's to spray the whole damn area. He turned to Gene Smith. Sheriff, get the Baron out here right away. Diane pressed forward and seized his arm. No, you can't do that, she cried. He glared at her with a how-dare-you-question-my-authority look. She shook her head and made a face. I'm sorry, she said. 
but you don't understand. Pesticides only make things worse. You could be letting yourself in for a lot of trouble. Listen, honey, returned the mayor in a patronizing tone of voice. You don't understand. The fair's only a couple of weeks away, and I don't want a bunch of damn hairy spiders the size of softballs crawling all over the countryside. Look, interrupted Diane, flaring up angrily, it's not just a bunch of spiders. It's a migration of some sort, probably caused by some kind of an imbalance, because a lot of ignorant people like you have killed off all their food with your stupid DDT or something stronger. She emphasized the words ignorant and stupid, narrowing her eyes and shaking a finger in his face as she continued. Let me tell you something else. There aren't just a few spiders out there. There are millions. Millions. Can't you understand that? And your town is right in their path. Well, honey, retorted the mayor condescendingly, if you can't spray, then why don't you tell us what will kill them? They're natural predators, she replied. Snakes, rats. I don't want to hear any more from you, little lady, bellowed the mayor, cutting her off impatiently. He turned to the sheriff. Jean, get the strongest pesticide available. I want to spray everything. Spider hills, fields, the whole area. The sheriff looked skeptical and scratched his head. The strongest thing available is paratheon, and we can't use that without permission from the state. Poppycock, roared the mayor. Rack stepped forward. He said, But that's deadly stuff. The amount of spray you'd have to use could endanger the whole town. One whiff of those fumes. Let me handle this, snapped the mayor, cutting him off. Jean, can you get some volunteers and start evacuating people from the outlying areas? The sheriff hesitated a moment, exchanging rapid glances with Rack. Mayor Connors, Diane demanded, are you willing to take full responsibility for this action? The sheriff here is in charge, replied Connors, deftly avoiding a direct answer to her question. Isn't that right, Jean? Smith shrugged. If you say so, he replied without conviction. Then let's get going, announced Connors in a tone that would have been more appropriate for the cutting of a ribbon or the awarding of a civic prize. In time of crisis, just put your trust in your mayor. The sight of his fatuous smile made Diane want to kick him in the paunch. Restraining herself, she turned and whispered to Rack, I think it might be a good idea if we talk to the pilot who's going to be doing the spraying. Can't hurt, replied Rack, but I doubt if you can talk him into refusing a job. Chapter 10 The Baron as the local crop duster was known, had a flair for the theatrical, favoring a six-foot white silk scarf and a mellow black leather jacket. He wore an old-fashioned helmet and goggles and a wide handlebar mustache. The only thing he lacked to complete the classic image was a pair of jodhpurs and boots. He leaned against the fuselage of his aircraft, an ancient but highly functional Stearman biplane, vintage 1935, and listened to Rack Hansen, who was saying, I've reported to the state that we're using Paratheon, and I can tell you this. There's going to be hell to pay once the bureaucracy gets moving. They don't like it a bit. The pilot zipped up his jacket. No more than I do, Rack, but at least I'm stepping up in class, from cutworms to spiders. Rack said, Our esteemed jackass, the mayor, is determined to get us all into trouble. Well, I'll tell you one thing, the Baron promised. By the time I'm through, there ain't gonna be a spider between here and the wide Missouri. He took a piece of chalk out of his pocket and made a mark alongside a batch of humorous insect decals, symbolizing his kills. That ought to be a good place for a spider, he observed. Rack was not in a jocular mood. Look, just stay well clear of town, he warned. That's pretty deadly stuff you're carrying. No sweat, the baron assured him. Then he climbed into the cockpit, strapped on his seat belt, and lowered his goggles. Rack stepped back and to one side to avoid the prop wash and watched. The baron pressed his starter. It was one of his concessions to progress, a post-World War II ignition and starter system. 
The engine coughed into life, throwing up a murky cloud of dust behind. Rack retreated a few yards more and waved as the Baron grinned and made the old RAF V for victory sign before taxiing up the small airstrip. Minutes later, the steerman was airborne, and the earth began dropping away. Banking steeply, the Baron headed first in the direction of the Colby place, leveling off and dropping down to the proper dusting altitude as soon as he was on course. The idea was to spray the entire area, and this was as good a place to start as any. Casually, he glanced down at the instrument panel. From underneath, a huge spider crawled out and paused, obscuring the fuel gauge, it peered at the pilot, waving its antennae slowly from side to side. The Baron glanced at the thing. Hey, he called aloud. Where did you come from? Don't you know we're supposed to be at war? As Rack pulled his Bronco into Earl Forbes gas station, the sound of the Baron's plane became appreciably louder. Diane peered up and out the window. Earl stepped away from the gas pump and peered into the sky, shielding his eyes from the glare with his hand. The engine was coughing, and the wings were wobbling erratically as the plane approached, losing altitude as it drew nearer. "'Don't he know better than to fly over town?' Earl muttered, punctuating his displeasure with a dark stream of tobacco juice. "'Hell's bells! That's poison he's carrying!' "'Don't you worry about the Baron.' Rack reassured Earl, squinting as he followed the approaching airplane with his eyes. He's okay. At that moment, the biplane roared over the gas station so low now that cans rattled as it passed. I hope you're right about that, observed Diane, as the plane executed a dangerous low double roll. I'd feel better if he knocked off the acrobatics, admitted Rack. He didn't want to say anything out loud, but he was worried. The Baron was a bit of a wild man, but he never took unnecessary chances. The way he was flying now, his double tanks filled with the deadly pesticide, was downright reckless. A dozen or more people in the area were now standing still, gawking at the careening biplane. Now it executed a tight loop over the center of town and began spewing the deadly poison from its tubes. A collective gasp of horror arose from the mouths of the spectators. "'The son of a bitch has gone out of his bird!' shouted Earl. The plane flipped sharply to one side, side slipping badly, and narrowly missing a high television antenna tower. Then righting itself momentarily, it began wobbling again like a drunken bee. Suddenly, after another turn, it began heading straight for the gas station, dropping rapidly as it hurtled forward. Rack saw at once it was going to crash. There was no time to talk, Grabbing Diane by the arm, he dashed across the road, dragging her with him like a rag doll. Diving for cover behind a wall, he threw a protective arm around Diane just as the plane hit and exploded with a deafening roar. The concussion sent flaming bits and pieces of debris flying in all directions as the people within range ran yelling and shouting for cover. Earl Forbes had barely made it behind Rack's Bronco. Now he picked himself up and ran out into the road. Rack, in the meantime, leaped to his feet and dashed back toward the flaming wreck, but the heat from the flames drove him back. Coughing and shielding his face, he retreated to where Diane was waiting for him, her face a frozen mask of horrified disbelief. Shortly afterwards, after hurrying to the sheriff's office, Diane made a series of hasty emergency phone calls while Rack and Jean watched the firefighters from the window. Ugly wisps of black smoke still drifted by from the scene of the disaster. The two men turned when Diane finally hung up the phone. "'I've called everyone I can,' she sighed. "'They said they'd send a team of investigators in a couple of days.' That's great, muttered Rack, his voice laden with annoyance. So what happens now? the sheriff asked her. How many damn spiders do you think are out there? She took a deep breath and shook her head. I wish I knew, she told him, staring at the floor. There are several theories concerning man's outcome if the insect world were ever to turn on him. She paused and looked him directly in the eye. All I can tell you, she continued, her voice considerably lower is that in none of them do we come out on top.
The sheriff grinned mirthlessly. Thanks for the news. I was worried for a moment. Rack sat on the edge of the desk and took his chin in his hand contemplatively. Look, he said. Baron didn't even touch those hills with his spray. I think somebody should take a run out to Birch's place. That's a good idea, agreed Smith, picking up the phone. I'd better call her. Hello, Mildred. Get me Birch, Colby. On the double. He waited and listened. Neither Rack nor Diane said anything. Finally, he hung up the phone again. No answer, he told them. I'd... I'd better take a run out there. Yeah, agreed Rack. Then turning to Diane, he said, I think we'd better get Terry and Linda and bring them into town, too. Even at the moment that Jean Smith climbed into his car to drive out to Birch Colby's, she stood in the kitchen of her house, back to the wall. Back to the wall, half paralyzed with terror, a revolver clutched in her trembling hands. Summoning every ounce of strength at her command, she aimed the weapon and fired. A huge spider on the countertop flew to pieces, and where it had stood was now a jagged hole. She focused her attention to the floor. Two more of the creatures scuttled crab-like toward her, lowering the revolver and screwing up her face until the muscles on her neck stood out taut. She fired again. A second spider disintegrated, its companion stopping in its tracks, becoming motionless save for the rapid waving of its antenna. Fuck. Three more spiders began closing in on her from the left. Kicking at the one nearest to her, directly in front, she slid along, her back still to the wall, in the direction of the kitchen window. It was her only way out now. The door to the kitchen was crawling with a swarm of the sickening things, so many that the sound of their slithery padding across the hard surface was distinctly audible. Birch reached out across the windowsill to grab the handle and throw it open, when a large spider sprang from the adjacent table with a sickening hiss. She felt a sharp pain as it sank its fangs into her flesh, and without thinking she pointed the revolver and fired again, blowing the spider and her hand into a hideous amalgam of blood, bone, hair, and venom. She could feel them now crawling up her ankles before the numbness began to spread, deadening the pain. She tried to scream, but her voice seemed to have disappeared, and as the revolver slipped from her hand, its weight having become too unbearably heavy, her knees gave way and she sank to the floor, mercifully unconscious, her body now completely obscured by a creeping, crawling, scuttling mass of wriggling, hairy spiders. Coincidentally, on the other side of town, Rack's niece, Linda, was swinging gaily back and forth on the swing he had built for her behind the house. Her mother's face appeared at the kitchen window about fifteen yards away, and they smiled at each other. Beneath the swing, spread out along the ground and following Linda's movements intently with their gleaming, beady eyes, were about thirty spiders. Squealing with glee as she swung back and forth, Linda was totally oblivious of their presence. The back door of the house opened onto the porch and Terry appeared. "'Time to come in for dinner, Linda,' she called. Swinging even harder than before, Linda's face became a mask of disappointment. "'Ah, can't I stay out a little longer, Mommy? I'm not hungry.' Terry came to the edge of the porch, shaking her head. "'No,' she insisted. "'It's time for dinner now, young lady.' Suddenly she caught sight of the spiders massing beneath the swing. The ground was alive with them now, squirming, wriggling, springing in the air and falling back as they attempted to get at Linda's feet each time she swung by. Linda! screamed Terry, her eyes wide with terror, her hands clutching tensely at her face. Startled by her mother's fright, Linda looked confused and began to slow down. Keep swinging! shouted Terry hoarsely. Then, throwing caution to the wind, she grabbed a broom from the porch and began beating a path through the spiders, which now numbered in the hundreds, streaming as they were from all directions. Her assault was so ferocious and determined, she actually succeeded in forcing the spiders to retreat momentarily, long enough for her to sweep Linda up into her arms from the swing. But in doing so, it was necessary for her to drop the broom. Saying nothing but making sure she had a grip on the child who now clung tightly, 
Her arms wrapped around her mother's neck. Terry whirled around and started racing for the house. The spiders regrouped now, no longer forced to hold back, and began swarming towards the fleeing woman. The porch was only about six feet away now, but the spiders were closing in and spreading out. Now they were all around, and those nearest were springing up and sinking their tiny talons into Terry's ankles. With every ounce of strength she had, she pushed Linda from her onto the porch and shrieked hoarsely, "'Run, Linda, run! Run for the house!' Screaming tearfully as she obeyed, Linda barely made it through the door, which she slammed shut behind her. Terry's knees gave way and she sank to the ground, her body a mass of stabbing, burning pains, as the swarming spiders covered her completely, biting viciously with their sharp, venomous fangs. Precious moments later, Rack and Diane arrived in the Bronco, pulling up just yards away. At the sight of the seething mass of spiders that had turned Terry's fallen body into shapeless, writhing form, Rack gasped in horror. "'Stay there!' he ordered Diane, leaping from the truck. So preoccupied were the spiders with what was left of Terry that they did not approach Rack at first, allowing him just barely enough time to dash to the house. He clambered up the steps of the porch and dashed to the door. It was locked. He kicked and kicked, finally forcing it open, and ran in. Linda stood on a table, weeping hysterically and cringing in terror. "'Mommy! Help Mommy!' she cried. In the brief interval of time that had elapsed after Rack broke into the house, about twenty spiders came trooping in. They were scuttling toward the table on which Linda stood. Rack seized a towel and began swatting them with it whip-fashion, successfully beating them away. Just then Diane appeared behind him. He could see her from the corner of his eye, and without missing a beat with the towel, he yelled, "'Take Linda to the truck and roll up the windows, but for God's sake, make sure there are no spiders!' Diane grabbed Linda without saying anything and dashed out, carefully avoiding the spiders as she ran. Rack followed across the porch and down the steps. There weren't that many spiders around now. They had either spread out more or gone elsewhere." Not more than ten of them still crawled over Terry. Rack bent down and tried to pull them off, but it was no use. She was obviously dead, and there was no point in endangering his own life. He grabbed the broom that lay near her on the ground and sprinted towards his bronco. Diane and Linda had not made it. Their path was blocked by a swarm of about a hundred spiders that were beginning to advance on them. "'Don't move,' warned Rack. Then he flanked the menacing spiders and began smashing at them with the broom. It was enough to disrupt them, and they immediately began scurrying out of the way, giving Rack barely enough time to herd Diane and Linda into the truck, after checking to make certain there were no spiders lurking inside. Sobbing convulsively, Linda curled up on Diane's lap in a fetal position as Rack started the engine and threw it into gear. His mind was racing. It was all he could do to concentrate on his driving. He could feel spiders crunching under the wheels as he sped away. Glancing over to his right, he could see that Linda was in bad shape. Her body had gone rigid, her eyes were staring, and the sobs had given way to rhythmic, low, animal-like whimpers. "'The lodge is pretty close by,' he said softly. "'We'll drop Linda off there.' His voice broke. "'It's insanity!' he muttered hoarsely. Diane put a hand on his arm. Terry, she began hesitantly. Is she... She didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell, he replied bitterly, jamming his foot down on the accelerator. Diane said nothing and drew closer the terrified child in her lap. Chapter 11 the bar at Washburn's Lodge was deserted, save for Rack, who paced sullenly back and forth, a water tumbler half full of bourbon in his hand. Diane, who sat glumly at the bar staring at him, and Emma Washburn. Emma stood behind the bar, the phone in her hand, listening intently for sounds that were not there. Diane reached out and touched Rack's arm as he passed her. Rack, she said, but he ignored her and kept pacing. If I'd gotten there ten minutes earlier, he snarled. Five minutes! 
Then, with a sudden gesture that vented both his fury and frustration, he smashed his glass against the wall, where it shattered into tiny fragments. They were still biting her after she was dead, he shouted, on the verge of cracking. Again, Diane put her hand on his arm in an effort to comfort him. He looked into her face, took a deep breath, and fought to regain his composure. How's Linda doing? he asked. Not very well, Diane replied softly. She's in severe shock. But remember this, Rack. If it hadn't been for you, she might not be alive now. Emma came over to join them, and Rack looked up at her hopefully. Did you get a hold of anybody? he asked. Emma made a wry face and shook her head. The phones are graveyard dead, she declared. Now will someone please tell me what the hell's going on around here? You guys are beginning to give me the jitters. Rack ignored her question. Emma, how many people have you got here right now? he asked. She looked puzzled and thought for a minute, then said, Well, just the Johnsons, Diane and you, myself and old Fred out back. Why do you ask? He still avoided a direct answer. Instead, he said, Look, Emma, I want you to do something without asking any questions, okay? Go round up Fred and get him in here. Then you and him lock the place up. I'll get the Johnsons. Emma looked annoyed. She was a straightforward woman who didn't care for double talk or subtlety. There was never any doubt about where she stood on any particular issue, and right now she was determined to find out exactly what was happening. She knew perfectly well from the way Rack and Diane were acting that something mighty peculiar was going on. She frowned and put her hands on her hips. Now, what the hell are you two talking about, lock the place up, she demanded. I ain't moving a damn inch till someone tells me exactly what's going on here. Beginning with, where's Terry? And what happened to little Linda? Terry's dead, Rack replied grimly. And we've got to get Linda to a hospital before it's too late. Emma's jaw dropped and her eyes widened as Diane interrupted Rack. Look, Emma, she declared, we don't have a lot of time to explain, but for some reason the spiders in this area, so far only the tarantulas as much as we can tell, have organized themselves into a deadly aggressive army. They've already killed Colby and Linda's mother, and God knows how many others we don't know about. Now please, Rack's right, we should get out of here as quickly as possible. Emma looked stunned. She looked from one to the other and realized that everything Diane had said was all too terribly true. Is that what happened to the Baron this afternoon? she asked. Most likely, Rack nodded. Now, come on, let's get a move on. As Emma was about to leave, Diane grabbed her by the arm. Do you have any chemical fire extinguishers here? she wanted to know. Yeah, replied Emma. I think there's a couple in the kitchen. Good said Diane. You go get Fred, and I'll get the extinguishers. Okay, I'll do that, Emma promised. She turned and hurried out of the room. At that moment, Vern Johnson and his wife Betty burst into the bar from the front entrance to the lodge. They were clearly agitated about something. Never seen anything like it, exclaimed Vern. Betty shuddered. One minute they weren't there, and the next minute there they were everywhere. Rack rushed over to them. He knew exactly what they were talking about, and he didn't like what he heard. Where? he asked tersely. Out in front, answered Betty, indicating with her head. Vern took Rack by the arm and led him to the front door. He said, I was flushing out the septic tanks on the Vogue, and when I turned around they were in little groups watching me. Boy, I don't mind telling you it gave me the creeps. What's it all mean? wailed Betty, turning her attention to Diane, who had just come out of the kitchen with the two fire extinguishers. Why are they out there? I mean, they're just spiders, aren't they? They can't hurt us, can they? She turned to Vern, looking as though she was about to burst into tears any second. Vern, she pleaded, I want to get out of here. I don't like this place. Ignoring both of the Johnsons, Rack pushed past Vern and headed for the front door with Diane hard on his heels. Vern put his arm around his wife and said soothingly, 
Now, baby, don't you worry. It's probably just some kind of tradition. You know, like those birds that keep coming back to Capistrano. You really think so? sniffled Betty, looking up at him. Out on the porch, Rack and Diane stopped and stared at the lawn and driveway beyond. Jesus! exclaimed Rack. Diane started to head for the steps as if she intended to go out on the lawn, but Rack grabbed her by the arm and held her back. There, not more than five yards from the front of the lodge, spread out in what could only be compared to military formations, were hundreds upon hundreds of spiders. They had formed themselves into platoons of between twenty to thirty per group, and stood there as if they were either going to commence advancing or tighten their lines. The way they stood almost motionless except for the waving of their antennae was uncanny and terrifying. It was plain to see that they were confident and relaxed at the moment. Their general attitude was certainly not overly aggressive, yet, based on what had happened thus far, there was no telling what they would do were anyone to challenge them or attempt to leave the lodge. "'How's it feel to be on the other end of the microscope?' asked Rack. "'Not funny,' shot back Diane. "'It wasn't meant to be,' he replied. Diane opened her mouth to answer, but never got the chance. A hideous, blood-curdling scream from the back of the lodge made her jump as if she had been stung. "'Get in the lodge and keep the Johnsons in there,' barked Rack. "'I'll get back as quick as I can.' She nodded, ran back inside, and slammed the door shut behind her. Rack leaped over the edge of the porch and hit the ground on the run. The screaming continued, and as Rack ran, he saw spiders everywhere, in groups, in pairs, and an occasional single. They were scurrying here and there in relative disorder, unlike the terrifyingly orderly regiments lined up in front of the lodge. Zigzagging like a soldier on the battlefield taking evasive action, Rack dashed through the myriads of spiders, taking care to avoid them as he ran. Once behind the lodge, he could see where the screaming came from. Emma stood before a small shack about twenty-five yards behind the lodge, clutching a small sapling for support. One hand was tearing at her hair, and her entire body was convulsed in agony. She was hysterical to the point of collapse. "'Emma!' shouted Rack. "'What in hell is wrong?' Instead of answering, she pointed to the shack, shaking her head as if trying to cast off some hideous vision. "'Get back to the lodge, Emma,' Rack ordered. "'I can't move,' she cried, her voice tinged with panic. "'Poor Fred! I can't move!' Expecting the worst, Rack went to the door of the shack and pulled it back on its hinges. It swung open, and the sight that met his eyes made him wince. Fred, the handyman, or what was left of him, lay atop a pile of wood, a piece of two-by-four clutched in his hands. The remains of a crushed spider were on the end of the wood. He was covered from head to toe in a silken, white, translucent cocoon. It was so fine that the features of his face could be clearly seen. The eyes were wide open and staring, the mouth twisted in a hideous gape, as if he had died in the midst of a cry for help. He looked desiccated and drawn as if all the fluids had been sucked from his body. The floor of the shack was alive with spiders crawling every which way. They moved slowly in sluggish fashion, as opposed to most of the others Rack had seen. They looked as though they had just gorged themselves. He slammed the door shut and seized Emma by the arm. "'Come on, Emma,' he said firmly. "'We're getting back inside while we still can.' She seemed to regain some of her former composure, enough at least to join Rack in the torturous dash back to the lodge, twisting and turning like a pair of football players as they ran. Although the total distance was not more than forty yards, it felt like a hundred by the time they got back inside and slammed the door shut behind them. Emma began to sob convulsively, and Rack helped her to a sofa as Betty Johnson ran over with Diane. "'I need a drink,' declared Rack hoarsely, striding over to the bar where Vern Johnson was finishing a beer. "'Give me a double bourbon,' he muttered, and Vern hurried to the other side of the bar to comply. While Betty remained at Emma's side, Diane came back to join Rack. "'What happened out there?' she demanded. Before Rack could answer, the front door to the lodge burst open, and everyone jumped. It was the sheriff, 
He slammed the door shut behind him and stomped over to the bar. You should have seen Birch Colby, he exclaimed, his voice strained and tense. Never seen anything like it. She looked like a skeleton, all covered up in a cocoon. The whole damn countryside's crawling with these things. He looked up at Rack's drink and added, I think I'll have one of them, too. As Vern Johnson, now pressed into service as bartender, poured a bourbon for Gene Smith, Rack said, Same thing happened to poor old Fred. He turned to Diane. What about those cocoons? Diane shrugged. It's the way spiders store their food away so they can come back and eat whenever they want. The sheriff moved toward the phone and said, I'd better call the state police and get some help out here. Phone's dead, Jean, Emma called from the sofa. He lifted it off the hook and listened, then shook his head, muttered something unintelligible, and replaced it. What none of them knew, or could know, was the reason for the telephone's failure. Less than an hour earlier, a band of spiders had crept into the town telephone exchange, and at that moment, as the amber lights on the switchboard flashed and blinked, Mildred, the operator, lay dead, a grimace of horror on her contorted features. Back and forth over her motionless body crawled a band of about fifteen spiders, busily spinning their cocoon which would soon encase her completely. As the sheriff lifted his glass to his lips, Vern Johnson leaned forward on the other side of the bar and blurted, I demand to know what's going on around here. Gene polished off his drink and set the glass down on the bar, wiped his mouth with his sleeve, and sighed. If we get a clue, he said wearily, we'll let you know. Now why don't you go sit down, have a drink or something? Vern made a wry face, then turned and went over to join his wife, muttering under his breath. Diane, seeing that Emma appeared to be regaining her composure, called over to her, "'Can I fix you a drink, Emma?' She shook her head and got to her feet. "'No, thanks, hun. she replied. "'I'll take over now. "'I'd better before you folks drink up all my stock.' She crossed the room and went behind the bar as Jean, Rack, and Diane headed for the front door. Gene nodded his head toward Vern Johnson as they passed him. I don't blame the guy, he said. I'd like to know what's going on, too. He peered out the front window at his car parked out in front. Have you been to town yet? Rack asked him. He shook his head. I'm heading there now, he announced. Soon as I put some high boots on, figured I'd go see if I could get a call through. Haven't been able to get a hold of my deputy. He turned around and called over to the bar, almost as an afterthought. Emma, you still got my old fishing gear around? She nodded and replied, All that stuff is still in the attic, where it's always been since you ran out on me. He grunted noncommittally and strode off in the direction of the staircase. Emma watched him for a moment, then sighed and said, Well, I guess I'd better put some soup on, just in case. She walked the length of the bar to the kitchen door and went over to the stove. Although not exactly a shambles, the place was in considerable disarray, as if whoever had been working there had suddenly decided to abandon it. On a large work table in the center of the room were two huge kettles of soup that had been prepared the night before and required only a heating. Emma lifted them one by one and put them on the stove over a strong, medium flame. Then she went over to the sink, where she began chopping some additional vegetables and chicken to add in. Preoccupied as she was, it was necessary for her to remain with her back to the stove. Consequently, when one, two, and finally a third large tarantula dropped from the vent above the stove, she was completely unaware of their presence. But when she turned to bring the extra ingredients over to drop in the soup, she spotted them standing there, motionless, waving their antennae as if they were scouting the area. Instead of panicking, she put the vegetables back down on the sink and walked over to the stove as if she hadn't seen the spiders. They remained motionless, watching her. Then, with a sudden lurch, she seized a pot of boiling water, dumped it on the spiders, scalding them to death. Then, at the top of her voice, she screamed, "'Somebody! Quick!' Rack rushed into the kitchen with a fire extinguisher in his hands, followed by Vern Johnson, 
wordlessly am appointed to the vent over the stove, and rack blasted it with the extinguisher. Gobs of foam dripped all over the stove, and spiders began dropping. In the soup, onto the burners, on the few uncovered areas, over a dozen in all. Rack handed the extinguisher to Emma, and grabbed several dish towels, which he began stuffing into the opening of the vent. Emma, he asked, do you have any lumber, hammer, nails, anything? I want to seal off cracks, openings, any place where they might be able to get in. I should have a whole cellar full of that stuff, she replied. I'll go get it, volunteered Vern. Just show me how to get there. Down the stairs behind that door, replied Emma, pointing. He crossed the room, opened the door, and flicked on a switch, turning on the lights in the cellar. Then he cautiously descended the narrow, rough-hewn wooden staircase. Stopping at the bottom, he glanced nervously around to survey the area. It was an ordinary-looking cellar, cluttered, dimly lighted by a pair of bare electric light bulbs screwed into sockets in the ceiling. Along one wall were cartons of canned goods and other supplies stacked from floor to ceiling. Directly opposite the wall was a large, vintage furnace that was pressed into service only during the cold winter months. At the far end of the room, directly in line with the staircase, was a rusty toolbox alongside a large pile of assorted timbers, boards, lathe strips, and other pieces of lumber. Vern walked over and contemplated it apprehensively before getting too close. It was the sort of place that everyone associated with spiders and other creatures that lurked in dark corners. He stepped forward and gingerly kicked the pile a few times, watching intently for any telltale signs of unwelcome life. Never had this much trouble with chemical toilets, he mumbled to himself as he started rummaging around in the toolbox. There were two hammers, and he took both of them for good measure. The nails were scattered all over the box, and it took him several minutes to gather them all up and drop them into his pockets. He started to get up when, as an afterthought, he took a saw. It might come in handy, he thought, if they wanted to get something into a tight place. Before gathering up an armload of wood, he took a fairly long one-by-two and stirred the woodpile again, just to make sure there was nothing crawling around in the dark. Once he was certain that there was no danger, he began selecting wood. Overhead, and beyond his line of sight, had he been looking in that direction, something began moving in a crack along a sheet metal duct that led to the furnace. It was just a speck at first, but as it worked its way through the narrow opening it proved to be a thick, jointed, hairy leg about two inches long. It waved about a few times, then drew back up again, unable to find enough space to allow passage for the rest of the body. Vern was completely unaware of the presence, however, and having gathered as much wood as he possibly could carry, he made his way back to the staircase. At the top of the stairs, he flipped off the light switch with a deft movement of his right elbow, plunging the cellar into darkness. There was no one in the kitchen now. The thought of the tarantulas falling into the soup had killed any incipient hunger pangs anyone might have had, and they all retreated to the main room of the lodge. As Vern emerged with his tools and wood, he could see the sheriff standing by the front door. His face was covered with grease, and he wore a pair of hip-length rubber fishing boots. "'Anybody you want me to get a hold of?' he asked. Diane took a pad and pencil from her pocket and began writing. When she finished, she tore off the sheet and handed it to him. "'Call this number and ask for Professor Palmer. Explain to him what's happening here.' "'Will do,' promised Jean, looking at the paper, then folding it carefully and putting it into his shirt pocket. Rack glanced at his wristwatch and said, "'If you're not back in an hour, Jean, then I'm packing everybody into that house on wheels out there and getting the hell out of here.' Sheriff Smith nodded soberly. "'That's fair enough,' he said. "'Keep an eye on old Emma for me. She's a good woman. Maybe one of these days I'm gonna let her catch me.' He turned and walked out the door, but Diane came after him and said, "'Jean, when you get to town, try to round up all the fire extinguishers you can.' "'You got it,' he promised. Then he turned and headed to where his car was parked. There were hundreds of spiders crawling around now, but their movements were erratic and not especially threatening. Jean edged his way through them without any great effort and climbed into the car.' 
looking up to wave once before he slammed the door behind him and drove off. Diane scanned the area around the lodge. There were spiders everywhere now, but no longer were they lined up in those large, disciplined, military-like groups. She frowned and wondered what the significance of this latest development was. Then, noticing several large spiders approaching, she kicked them off the porch and retreated back into the lodge. Chapter 12 It was relatively quiet now. Rack, Diane, Emma, and the Johnsons were sitting at the bar half-heartedly munching sandwiches that Emma had prepared and insisted that they eat. Rack was saying, Now we're going to be getting out of here pretty soon, so I don't want anyone wandering off. His words were interrupted by a blood-curdling, high-pitched scream from upstairs. Linda! exclaimed Rack, dashing to the stairs and running up with the others right behind him. The screams grew louder. They sounded inhuman, becoming a single terrible tone, rising and falling like a siren. Rack flung the door to Linda's room open. She was in the middle of the bed, screaming and flailing her arms and legs like a thrashing machine. The bed was alive with ugly, hairy spiders. Rack grabbed the corner of her blanket and pulled, propelling the little girl into the air and towards him. He caught her and spun around, flinging her across the room and out the door. Several spiders still clung to her as she hit the floor. Then, before she could get up, a blast from the fire extinguisher in Diane's hands hit her and knocked the spiders off. Emma swept the hysterical child up into her arms as Diane tossed the extinguisher to wreck. He aimed the nozzle at his legs, which were now covered with spiders, and let loose a blast. The spiders scattered in all directions, and Rack hastily retreated, slamming the door to the bedroom shut behind him. Without a moment's hesitation, Diane dropped to her knees, pulled a couple of throw rugs over, and began forcing the edges into the crack beneath the door. Meanwhile, Rack and the others hastened down to the main floor again. Linda was beginning to snap out of her trauma, but she clung to Rack for support. He looked at Vern and said, Look, you get Betty and Emma. Then the minute Diane gets down here, we're getting the hell out. It's out of the question, Rack, countered Diane, having heard him as she came down the stairs. My God, they're everywhere. There are thousands of them out there. We'd never make it. He turned on her, his face flushed with fury. What in the hell are you talking about? No damn spider's going to stop me from going anywhere. And without any warning, he flung Linda over his shoulder and went to the front door, throwing it open only to admit about forty large wriggling spiders that began clambering up his legs before he had a chance to avoid them. As he slammed the door shut with a shudder, Diane seized a fire extinguisher and let loose a blast, knocking the spiders from his legs. Immediately, Vern and Emma began stomping those nearest them and throwing whatever objects were most readily available at the rest. Driven by an absolute determination to survive, they succeeded in killing the spiders in about five minutes. Rack then handed Linda to Emma and went over to the window. The horror that assailed his eyes was wilder than the most bizarre nightmare he had ever had in his life. The ground was no longer visible. Not a blade of grass, not a pebble could be seen. Instead, as far as the eyes could see, there was a wriggling, seething, crawling sea of black, hairy objects. Listening in stunned horror as he stared, he could hear a continuous crackling, crunching sound. The color drained from his face, and he turned to face the others, his throat dry and his heart pounding. His attention was diverted by a scream. "'Oh, my God!' shrieked Betty. They're coming down the fireplace. Vernon, look! All eyes focused on the fireplace as sooty tarantulas began dropping down and scurrying out on the hearth. Rack dashed over, grabbed a piece of wood, and threw it in. Emma, he shouted. Quick, get me some more kerosene. More of the ugly things were dropping down now with sickening plops. Rack threw some more wood into the fireplace, stomping spiders as fast as he could while the others joined in, beating and stomping the creatures. Emma returned from the kitchen with a can, which she handed to Rack. He splashed its contents onto the wood, stepped back, and took a match from his pocket. Then, striking it, he tossed it in, and with a low-pitched whoosh, 
the flammable liquid ignited. Concentrating their efforts on the remaining spiders in the room, they grabbed whatever weapons they could and aggressively pursued the remaining spiders. Those that kept dropping down the flue were incinerated within seconds, and soon they stopped, undoubtedly discouraged by the rising smoke and heat. As Rack, Diane, and the others fought their desperate battle against the invading army of arachnids, Sheriff Gene Smith pulled into a town that had been transformed from a peaceful little hamlet into a hellish Armageddon of terror and blind pandemonium. The streets and sidewalks were black with spiders, as were the sides of buildings, telephone poles, and benches. People were running hysterically in all directions, screaming, stumbling, flailing about, falling and dying. No one was free of spiders, and bodies lay everywhere, some with the beginnings of cocoons around them. "'Oh, my God!' gasped Jean to himself. "'This has got to be a nightmare from hell!' He tried to ease the car down the middle of the street, the sickening crunch of tarantulas rising and mingling with the screams and cries. Upon seeing the car, those few still capable of locomotion ran toward it, beating at the windows in terror. Their faces were swollen into hideous caricatures from the spider bites. One man's face was featureless, an undistinguishable ball of blood and pus. Gene winced and hated himself for not stopping, but what could he do? They were already dead for all practical purposes. He, at least, had a slim chance. He kept edging the car forward. He would make a U-turn at the end of the block and head back to the lodge while there was still time. Suddenly, a woman, screaming in agony, her body crawling with spiders, dashed from a building and hurled herself into the path of the sheriff's car. Even though he was going no more than twenty miles per hour, he was unable to swerve as she struck the grill and slid back under the wheels. Fighting to suppress every instinct he had that told him to stop, get out, and try to help the poor creature, Jean kept going. The sound of shattering glass off to his left made him turn his head, just in time to see Mayor Connors careen through the plate glass window of the barber shop, his body crawling with spiders. He fell to his knees then tried to get up while clawing at the spiders, in a fruitless effort to free himself from their relentless attack. Seeing these two horrific tragedies, one right after the other, had an unnerving effect. Although it wasn't quite as serious as actually losing control of the car, Jean went distinctly off course briefly, shooting diagonally across the street just as an old jalopy came screeching around the corner and crashed into a tall, imposing tower. The old car burst into flames. Jean swerved in time to avoid being struck, but skidded sideways so that the side of his car slammed into another that had been abandoned in the middle of the street. The heat and flames from the burning car were uncomfortably close, and when Jean looked up, to his horror, he saw that the water tower was collapsing and coming right at him. To try escaping from the right would be suicidal, for it would lead directly into the path of the disintegrating tower. The door by the driver's seat was wedged against the abandoned car, and he couldn't get it open. He was still struggling when the tower crashed directly on his car, crumpling it like a beer can struck by a sledgehammer. He opened his mouth to scream, but the expression froze on his face. Chapter 13 Night had fallen, and the small beleaguered band in Washburn's Lodge were preparing themselves for their first full night of siege. Rack and Vern had finished nailing, planking, and other assorted strips of wood over every conceivable opening through which the swarming spiders might slip. Their faces were damp with sweat, and as they rolled up their sleeves and wiped their foreheads, Betty came over to her husband, who had just discarded his hammer. "'Why is it so hot in here?' she asked, frowning and wiping her moist palms against the side of her dress. Emma walked over to a thermostat on the wall nearest to where she had been seated. She examined it closely, then turned to the others. "'Air conditioner's running,' she announced. "'There's just nothing coming out of the vents.' Rack glanced up at the register in the ceiling to see if there was anything obvious causing an obstruction. He could see the nature of the problem at once." The slats were closed. "'Hey, Vern, give me a hand,' he called. 
The two men took a heavy table and dragged it across the floor until it was positioned directly under the closed vent. Rack climbed up, peered at the fixture, then reached up to open the vents. As he worked, Betty came over to watch. The slats seemed to be stuck, and Rack had to struggle with them, but finally he felt them give. He had barely gotten them open, however, when gobs of black, greasy dirt came cascading down, and he averted his head to avoid getting it in his eyes. A scurrying sound made him look up again in time to see about ten spiders come crowding out. Their legs wriggled frantically as they began dropping down, and before Rack could close the vent again, they had tumbled to the floor and on Betty's neck and shoulders. "'Get them off me!' she shrieked hysterically, clawing and flailing her arms. "'Get them off! I can't stand them!' Vernon knocked them to the floor and began stomping them with his feet. Emma and Diane converged on the spot and crushed the others, as Betty sank to the floor, convulsed with sobs. "'Please, please, Vern, take me away from here. They're awful. I hate them!' He knelt down and comforted her with an embrace and whispered, "'Don't worry, honey. It'll be all right. You'll see. Why don't you come and lay down for a while?' He gently helped her to her feet and led her to the sofa where she buried her face in a pillow and continued sobbing as he sat helplessly beside her, stroking her head. Diane, standing nearby, glanced at her wristwatch. "'What time is it?' asked Rack. "'Eleven p.m.,' she replied, pausing, a pained look coming over her face. "'The sheriff should have been back a long time ago.' "'Not necessarily,' disagreed Rack. He may have gone into Cottonwood, uh, maybe even into Flagstaff. There's no telling what. Depends on whether this thing is localized or not. His words were positive, but there was no conviction behind them. Emma tried to force a wistful smile. She said, Patience, honey. You've got to be patient. I spent a lot of years waiting for that man. I can hold out a few hours more. Look, suggested Rack, glancing from Emma to Diane and back again. Oh, why don't you two try and get some rest? I'm going to check around and make sure everything's secure. Emma nodded her head in agreement and addressed Diane. That's the best idea I've heard yet. Come on, honey. Diane did not especially share Emma's opinion, and she threw a sharp glance of protest at Rack. But before anyone could say anything, there was a tinkle of breaking glass coming from upstairs. All three of them started nervously and exchanged worried glances. "'What was that?' gasped Diane. "'It must have come from one of the bedrooms,' answered Rack, "'glancing hastily over his shoulder at one of the windows near the front door. "'Thousands of black, wriggling spiders were scrambling over it, scratching at the glass. "'The thin, brittle pane was all that stood between them "'and the seething mass of ferocious tarantulas outside, "'clawing, scratching, scrambling to get in.' There was another tinkling of glass breaking upstairs. "'I'd better go up and have a look,' Rack told them. He had barely started toward the staircase when a loud, sharp, cracking sound rang out. The three of them spun around to face the direction from which it had come. Emma's eyes widened, and her hands flew to her face. "'Oh, my God!' she gasped. A long diagonal crack had appeared in the main window facing the porch. It was giving way under the sheer weight of the assaulting spiders. Johnson, barked Rack, is there any more lumber? The lights flickered on and off just then. Automatically, all three jerked their heads up in unison. Instead of answering, Vern sucked in his breath sharply. Then, glancing back at Rack, he said, There's still some in the basement, but not enough to cover up that picture window. We can use the furniture for wood, interjected Emma. This junk was always too tacky anyway. Rack surveyed the room and went over to a large table, just as another crack appeared in the window with a loud report like a rifle shot. Come on, give me a hand, he gestured impatiently to Vern, who ran over. Together they slid the table over toward the window. It was barely large enough to cover it completely. I'll get the hammer and nails, volunteered Diane, as the two men struggled to get the table in place. That's fine, said Emma. You fellas hold it there and I'll do the hammering. At that moment the lights blinked out and the room was plunged into darkness, save for the flickering flames in the fireplace. Betty let out a squeal of distress. Emma, called Rack. Where's the fuse box? In the basement along the back wall. 
Rack turned away from the window. Diane, you get Linda. Emma, get everyone into the kitchen. The tinkling sound of more glass could be heard breaking upstairs. Hurry, he urged. There's a flashlight in the toolbox, volunteered Vern. I'll get it for you. Rack shook his head impatiently. No, just get into the kitchen with the others. Diane raced to the sofa and took the sleeping Linda up into her arms as Emma ushered Vern and Betty into the kitchen. Rack then went over to the toolbox, opened it, and after fumbling for a moment or two, found the flashlight. Next, he picked up a fire extinguisher, headed into the darkened kitchen, and without a word to the others, went straight for the basement door, the beam from his flashlight stabbing like a long yellow pole ahead of him. He hesitated at the head of the stairs, and aimed the flashlight into the cellar, which now was pitch black. Cautiously, he made his way down the steps and across the room to the back wall, where the fuse box was located. A pale beam of moonlight spilled across the floor from a small, dusty window to one side, which miraculously was not obscured by spiders. When he reached the back wall, he froze. The fuse box was crawling with spiders. Suddenly, his attention was distracted by an unexpected, high-pitched screech. He whirled around and focused the light in the direction from which the sound came. It was a large rat, several spiders attached to its back, scurrying in panic along an asbestos-wrapped duct, which was also crawling with spiders. He turned his attention back to the fuse box again, took a deep breath, and stepped forward. Knocking as many spiders off as he could with his bare, free hand, he checked the fuses. From all sides, more spiders began crawling over his hands, the stinging of their jabbing fangs burning like fire. He shook them loose and unscrewed the burnt-out fuse as more of the noxious little beasts began attacking. Several times they prevented him from changing the fuse. They were on his neck now, his shoulders, and crawling up his legs. He was a mass of burning pain now. In desperation, he picked up the fire extinguisher and aimed it at the fuse box. A faint hiss issued from the nozzle. It was empty, and with a hoarse obscenity, he flung it across the room. Then, despite the growing dizziness that threatened to overwhelm him, he finally managed to screw in a fresh fuse. Staggering back, he turned and started for the stairs. The flashlight became suddenly unbearably heavy and slipped from his hand to the floor. He stumbled forward, waves of nausea overcoming him, and in a final, desperate effort to rid himself of the spiders, he tore the shirt from his back as he fell to the floor. Fighting unconsciousness, he crept to the stairs, and only by virtue of sheer willpower did he manage to drag himself up to the kitchen. By the time he pulled himself through the door, the kitchen was brightly lighted. The last thing he saw before his vision went all blurred was Vern hammering a piece of plywood over a small window. Then he collapsed in a heap, spiders all over him. Emma! screamed Diane. Get some ammonia, quick! It'll neutralize the venom! As Emma dashed to a cabinet beneath the kitchen sink, Vern and Diane beat the spiders from Rack's prostrate body and one by one crushed them to death. Then Diane reached out and grabbed the bottle from Emma's hands, deftly removing the cap and expertly applying the pungent liquid to Rack's wounds. "'Will he be okay?' asked Emma apprehensively. Instead of answering directly, Diane said, "'Roll up his pants legs and check for more bites.' Emma obeyed without speaking. There were about a dozen ugly punctures around his ankles and calves, Diane copiously poured the liquid over the afflicted areas, then put down the bottle. I'll massage one leg, you do the other, she directed Emma. Then to Vern, pour more on his neck and hands, then you and Betty massage, and hurry. It's the only chance we have to save him. Chapter 14 It was morning, although with the windows boarded up it was impossible to tell what time of day it was, and the only illumination came from the electric lights above. The clock on the wall indicated six o'clock. Betty and Vern were curled up in each other's arms in the corner, fast asleep. Linda lay sleeping atop a nest of dish towels and clothes that Emma had made the night before. Emma sat slumped in a small chair by the kitchen table and was beginning to wake up. 
She stirred, changed position, and began rubbing the sleep from her eyes, then yawned and looked around at the shambles. She made a sour face and shook her head slowly. Christ, what a god-awful mess, and what a god-awful night. What time is it? Diane was sitting on the floor, leaning against a cabinet alongside the table which held the prostrate rack. She glanced up at the clock, yawned and stretched, and said, Nearly six o'clock. Then she looked down at Rack. He was pale, and his face looked puffy, but he opened his eyes and forced himself into a sitting position. I'll be all right, he said weakly. Emma yawned again, pulled herself out of her chair, and headed for the stove. Catching sight of herself in a small mirror on the wall, she grimaced. Christ, at my age, a woman needs a good night's sleep more than anything. Almost with an unconscious gesture, she fluffed her hair and turned to Rack and Diane. Jean could never stand the sight of me first thing in the morning. Did you know that? They said nothing, and she went on. He used to say, Emma, for Christ's sake, go get some coffee inside you before I even take a look at you. Her voice broke, and she stared down blankly at the floor, old memories stirring up within her as she tried to fight back the tears that welled up in her eyes. Rack went over to her and put his arm around her shoulders. Emma, he said gently, we can't be sure. Yes, we can, Rack. He'd have been back here by now. She pulled away from him and went over to the stove. I'll start the coffee. No one had noticed Vern and Betty getting up, but he now went over to the door leading to the main room of the lodge and peered out. Hey! he said brightly. It's clear out there, not a spider in sight. Are you sure? asked Diane, rushing over to see. Take a look for yourself. She came over to the doorway and scanned the area, then turned to Vern. You're right. It seems okay to me. He moved out into the room. I think I'll turn on the radio, he called back. See if I can get any news. As he went over to the radio behind the bar, Rack and Diane came out of the kitchen and watched him. Vern flicked it on and turned the dial. He waited patiently for it to warm up, then glanced at his watch as a steady crackle of static suddenly blared forth from the speaker. He tried several other stations and continued to get nothing but static. Frowning, he tuned back to the original spot on the dial. Give it a couple of more minutes, Rack advised. Then he turned around and stared at the front door. I think we ought to take a look out there. It's daylight now. He started moving toward the door. Rack, called Diane from the bar, running out into the middle of the room. He stopped and turned to face her. She was frowning and tense. You mustn't take the chance. Even for a split second, you could let hundreds of them in. Don't worry, Diane. I'll be careful. Emma came up alongside Diane. Make it one of the windows, Rack. If they'd broken through the glass, we'd have heard it. Rack shrugged. Okay, if it makes you feel easier. Then he turned and went over to one of the windows and reached up to pull off a plank that had been nailed over it. He tugged at it several times, but it wouldn't budge. He went back to get the hammer when the static on the radio stopped abruptly, and in place of the steady crackling, the speaker now emitted a steady beeping tone, indicating that the station was about to commence its broadcast day. It was a low-power station with a 6 a.m. to sunset license. Rack paused for a moment and glanced at the radio, then continued to the toolbox to get the hammer. Diane and Emma gathered around to listen with Vern as Rack went back to the window and began loosening the board. "'Well, good morning, you happy folks out there in the land of paradise,' blared the voice of the announcer. It's a glorious morning. The sun is shining. There is not a cloud in the sky. The temperature right here at your favorite station is a beautiful 61 degrees, and the weatherman says it's going to warm up during the day real good. As the voice droned on, Rack stopped again and listened impatiently. Emma clenched and unclenched her fists. Betty came out of the kitchen now and drifted to Vernon's side, her eyes red and frightened. Diane looked frustrated and confused. After what had been going on since the day before, this endless stream of cliched platitudes made no sense. Yet it was a voice from the outside, a sign that they weren't the last people alive on earth, that somewhere, 
not very far away. It was just another day, business as usual. It was vivid evidence that maybe they still had a chance. The voice went on, and they hung on every word. Now, I hope you're all going to stay tuned for some good old down-home country music with your friendly host, good old Uncle Bill. We got a pile of albums here. Must be a mile high. All of them your real perennial favorites. And there's nothing like country music to wake up to on a fine morning like this. Of course, the news, everything that's happening on the local scene, will follow at 7 a.m. So now, for openers, it's Dorsey Burnett and his country pickers in Green Verity Valley. A lively tune and a great place to live. Rack scowled and raised his hammer. Come on, come on, for Christ's sake, he snarled. But at the sound of music blaring forth, he realized that nothing he could do would change things, and he turned back to the window where he went back to work prying the board loose. Linda, who had been sleeping on the couch, woke up and began crying softly. Diane hurried to her side and put a comforting arm around her. Emma stood nervously, watching Rack work on the board. The nails groaned as he pulled them out one by one. Finally, with the last one coming loose, the board splintered. We sure did one hell of a job nailing these damn boards up, he muttered as he pulled the pieces loose. There was now a gap small enough to cover again should it become necessary, but large enough to see through. He bent over and peered out. This is crazy, he said, frowning, and turned for a moment to Diane. Then, grasping the jagged end of the remaining board, he wrenched a larger piece free. The color drained from his face and an expression of shocked horror crossed his features. "'Dear God!' he exclaimed. Diane stepped forward, alarm written all over her face. "'Rack, what is it?' she demanded. Like a madman, he now began ripping off all the boards, almost unconsciously in rhythm with the blaring country music on the radio. It only took him seconds to free the window completely. "'Sweet Jesus!' He croaked as the others gathered around him, staring at the window in stunned disbelief, unable to find words. Outside the window, covering it completely, was a filmy, white, translucent gauze, brilliantly lighted by the rays of the morning sun. A hurried check of the other windows and the front door revealed the same silky covering. As they backed off, dumbfounded, the music came to an end, and the announcer's voice came in again. That was Darcy Burnett's latest hit brought to you by KLBJ, broadcast from downtown Prescott where nothing's shaking but the leaves and the trees. The time is 7.22. And now a little more cheerful music for you morning shut-ins out there. Directly overhead, a passing helicopter pilot peered down and screwed up his face in a puzzled frown. He flew this way frequently on his way to Phoenix. That was supposed to be Camp Verde down there. What the hell was going on, he wondered. Then he glanced at the mini calendar on his watch band and grinned to himself. That was it. They were getting ready for the county fair soon. It was probably some kind of a promotional gimmick. Whatever they'd done, it sure was clever. From up here, it looked exactly as if something like a giant moth had spun cocoons around all the houses and buildings in the area. He chuckled to himself and shook his head. It figures, he thought. After all, what else is there to do out here in the boonies but sit around and figure out how to do weird things? He gave the chopper a little more throttle and stayed on course. Maybe, when the fair was on, he'd drive out and see what the town looked like from the ground. Hello, this is John Olson, and you have been listening to the audiobook of Kingdom of the Spiders. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I had a fairly fun time reading it. I read this entirely from the bedroom that I sublet in Seattle. I am out in Seattle, Washington, working a summer job with the Seattle International Film Festival. This is my second year in a row working for SIF, and it's... Uh, it's an enjoyable job, and it's fun to be out here, fun to scurry around watching movies in the many, many fine theaters around Seattle in my free time, and uh, fun to be able to wake up on my days off 
and record a few chapters of an audiobook of some ridiculous novelization. Kingdom of the Spiders is a film I have never seen. It's been on my watch list, but I have failed to actually ever watch it. But, of course, I am fascinated by anything with William Shatner in it because, like, uh, like certain other actors, such as Tom Cruise, but, but more so, I feel, William Shatner has a fascinatingly, compellingly not great acting, but still a compelling screen presence. I uh, recently finally did watch all of the original Star Trek episodes, and there's really something magical about Bill Shatner. There is something amazing. And I've been meaning to go back and watch all of his pre-Star Trek and post-Star Trek series, pre-Star Trek movies, films, because those are where the... That's where the real special Shatner lives forever in cinema history. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. And other than that, all I have to say is, oh boy, this is a hard book to read in some ways because I was spitting tacks half the time because the writer kept referring to spiders as insects, kept referring to them as having antennae, and that was just pissing me off right and left because spiders are arachnids, not insects. And they don't really have antennae. And, oh man. Oh man. In that first third of the book, he, he used one or the other of those terms referring to spiders about 25 times. And every time I had to resist this compulsion to fucking throw the book at the wall. But... Then, as you may have noticed, late in the book, finally, he referred to them as arachnids, and I begrudgingly, with gritted teeth, will, will accept that as a, an apology or an acknowledgement of some kind. So, so okay. Anyway... That's enough of me rambling. Traditionally, my uh, audiobook outros from my Seattle recordings have been ridiculously long and rambly. Listen again to the end of Squirm or Nosferatu if you want an example. Or don't, because really, who needs that? Life is short. Life is too short to listen to me ramble aimlessly about whatever the fuck. Anyhow, thank you for joining me on this journey through the Kingdom of the Spiders novelization. And, as always, love and thanks to all of you for listening to Audiobooks for the Damned.